My name is Constanze Fuhrmann and I'm the head of unit environment and cultural heritage at the German Federal Environmental Foundation, DBU. And uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our follow-up event called German Challenges for Climate Science and Heritage. We have received numerous registrations from a wide range of institutions and we are very delighted with this great response because it just shows uh, the great interest in this very important topic. Today we want to come together in order to present you the outcomes of the International Expert Meeting which was taking place last year in December and which was jointly organized by ECOMOS, the UNESCO and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and was funded by the German Federal Environmental Foundation. The meeting was actually the first ever meeting about synergies between culture and climate science in the common fight against climate change and experts came together to explore the linkage and to summarize the findings in three white papers we'd like to introduce to you now. And during an afternoon session, we want to identify how these findings can be important for the German speaking countries. I think great results have been achieved. So congratulations to all experts involved. It's really very good. And uh, yeah, so far I'm, before I'm handing over to the speakers, let me just say a few words to the program. We are going to have a short welcome session now, followed by an introduction of the project, the international meeting itself. And after a short break, we will be having the presentations of the three white papers, obviously the short discussion. So feel free to ask questions. And yeah, the last part of the event is the exchange on the challenges for the German speaking countries, uh, which is in the afternoon in, in German language. And um, I also would like to give you some technical information. I kindly ask you to switch off the microphone and another advice, uh, the event is being recorded. So just uh, that you know. I would now like to hand over to the president of ECOMOS International, Teresa Patricio, a warm welcome to you. I'm very pleased to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Constanza. Um, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, first, good morning all. It is a, really a great pleasure that uh, I address you uh, on behalf of ECOMOS International. I would like, of course, to thank and to congratulate ECOMOS Germany and uh, DBU for the organization of this uh, follow-up event to the um, German Experts Workshop in support of the UNESCO ECOMOS EPCC meeting to strengthen synergies between cultural heritage and climate change uh, science. ECOMOS, of course, is engaged with uh, global uh, reflections to develop strategies on how heritage places can respond to global challenges and build more resilient and sustainable human development. We know that as a result of man-made climate change, the world is in an ecological crisis in this precise moment, Pakistan is suffering and paying a dreadful price for that. Um, the Paris Agreement in 2015 created an international agreed upon temperature goal for the sake of people and the planet. We must, we must contain global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, over pre-industrial levels. And more than anything else, this is an urgent matter of safeguarding cultural heritage. We are already seeing loss and damage in many areas and many countries of the globe. And we know from downscaled climate models that the in situ conservation uh, of many heritage places will be simply not be possible at higher rates uh, of warming. Um, as an international heritage organization, uh, ECOMOS takes it uh, for granted that the sustainable use of heritage is uh, the cornerstone of activities to mitigate the effects of climate change. It is essential that we find ways uh, to ensure that cultural and heritage are taken into account in the fight against climate change and that they are central to all international agendas. Strengthening synergies between cultural and climate science is uh, our common fight against climate change and was, of course, at the center of the international co-sponsor meeting on cultural heritage and climate change last December, as well as at the center of our preoccupations today. Um, 
to analyze and comprehend the three commissioned white papers from the meeting of December in terms of knowledge, system, uh, impact and solutions will certainly help advancing heritage and cultural based actions uh, for climate change adaptation and carbon mitigation. In the coming years, the EPCC will contribute to the global assessment of the Paris Agreement, uh, aiming to take stock on the implementation of the Paris Agreement in order to access the world's collective progress towards its long-term goals. And ECOMAS believes that cultural and heritage are essential uh, to recognize and respond to the climate uh, risk and will therefore be central uh, to all this process. Cultural, we believe that cultural and heritage are both threatened by the effects of climate change, but also that they are part of the solution. Uh, cultural and heritage can, can contribute to a just transition and to the achievement of the objectives of the Paris Agreement, taking into account different national and regional circumstances. Therefore, I would like to congratulate the DBU for all the reflections and exchanges in the topic, in the topics of cultural heritage and climate change. I applaud you for this, and uh, I also thank you, thank my colleagues from Ecomos Germany for their enthusiasm in take, tackling these topics. I hope that your work today here uh, will serve as an example to others and uh, that the cultural and heritage dimensions of climate change will be addressed in every country and in every region of the world. So it is my greatest pleasure to participate in this today meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for the kind and of course, very important words. Uh, up next is Alexander Bonde, Secretary General of DBU. Unfortunately, he can't be with us in person, but he would like to express his sincere thanks to all of us digitally. So we are going to upload his greetings now. Dear Miss Patricio, dear Mr. Maga, dear Miss Osagraha, dear speakers and participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Heat waves becoming more intense and frequent in Europe, new record levels of concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane, the climate crisis is omnipresent. We are in the midst of a starting climate crisis. We had to experience that in the most severe way last year in Germany with dramatic floods in the West, with many lives and livelihoods lost and insurance companies claiming that year to be the most expensive in history. Again, the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change relentlessly shows us how the man-made climate crisis is progressing. It outlines in devastating effects on people and ecosystems. The result might not be surprising, but they should finally wake us up. Adaptation measures are important to reduce the risks of future weather extremes, not only for ecosystems and us humans, but also for our cultural and natural heritage, an aspect that still tends to remain unconsidered in the public discussion. This is alarming because the climate crisis, the increased incidence of natural disasters and the loss of biodiversity pose one of the greatest risks to our cultural and natural heritage in Germany, in Europe, and worldwide. Changes in temperature or precipitation are leading to grave threats to historic structures and materials, aggravating the physical, chemical, and biological deterioration already at play. Climate models show that the preservation of many heritage sites will not be possible at higher rates of warming as the adaptive capacity of historical sites is limited. At the same time, heritage has much to offer for climate response and action initiatives. Understanding both the risk and the potential is critical for future-oriented heritage management and conservation, and it needs to be discussed more intensively, intensively in politics and research, such as climate science, where the profound impact on heritage is still often received too little attention. 
The German Federal Environmental Foundation, DBU, would like to make an important contribution to increasing the visibility of these challenges. One of our mission, missions is to drive innovation and research in the field of cultural heritage and to reflect the principles of sustainable development in our commitment to preserve it. 30 years ago, we already recognized the damaging impact of environmental influences to heritage, leading to climate change being included in our funding guidelines and therefore making the DBU one of the few institutions in Germany to, Germany to fund new approaches for climate adaptation in that field. Here, we have initiated a significant number of activities that focus on involving risks associated with climate change. Against this background, the project Connecting Culture, Heritage and the IPCC is particularly important to us. It has paved the way for strategic recommendations on integrating cultural and natural heritage into the international climate discourse and to explore the role of culture as a key resource for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Several aspects make this project stand out. It initiated the first in-depth analysis on a global scale. It identified research gaps and relevant protection measures. It helps to make the challenges we are facing in the heritage sector visible in climate science and society. And finally, it meets the long-standing demand by the UNESCO World Heritage Committee to intensify the cooperation of the state parties with IPCC for the protection of cultural heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great, great pleasure to welcome you to today's event, which follows up on the international co-sponsored meeting on cultural heritage and climate change that was organized by UNESCO, ICOMOS and IPCC last year in December. We are now looking forward to discussing the results that have been achieved since then by our panel of international experts who summarize their key findings in three white papers on knowledge systems, on climate and cultural heritage, on the effects, vulnerability and understanding of risks, as well as solutions for adaptation. The international meeting showed us that together we have great potential to advance the interdisciplinary dialogue. A dialogue we should seek to consolidate also in the German speaking countries Today, we want to encourage you to discuss these findings and the applicability to the regional context to see how we can foster the discussion and practice around these topics here. I would now like to wish you all an inspiring day and like to express my appreciation for the fruitful cooperation with IPCC and UNESCO, especially Shoti Rosagara, the Deputy Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center and Mechthild Rösler, the former director. I also like to sincerely thank the team of ICOMOS for its high level of personal commitment to the project and climate change mitigation in the context of the Paris Agreement. First of all, our partners from ICOMOS Germany, Tino Maga, Jörg Haspel, Dorothee Bösler and Maria Baudis, who have made a lot of effort to realize this series of events here in Germany and thus advance this important discussion. And equally important to the international ICOMOS team, Marie-Louise Lavenier, Director General, Willy McGarry, co-chair for the international co-sponsored meeting, as well as Marcy Rockman, the former co-chair. Hannah Morell and Andrew Potts, the project coordinators, and Gaia Jungblatt, Director of the International Secretariat. I'm now looking forward to a fruitful discussion on this very important issue. Thank you very much. Okay. So it's my great pleasure now to give the floor to Jyoti Hosograha, the Deputy Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center. Jyoti, it's uh, really an honor to have you here with us today. Are you here? I can't see you. Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for those kind words and, and warm welcome. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, first of all, I want to thank ICOMOS uh, German National Committee and the German 
Federal Environmental Foundation, DBU, for convening this meeting today. It is my great pleasure to join you for this event on uh, German Challenges for Climate Science and Heritage, organized uh, following the IPCC UNESCO ECOMOS International Co-sponsored Meeting on Culture, Heritage and Climate Change that was held in December 2021. This IPCC, UNESCO, and ECOMOS initiative on culture, heritage, and climate change represents a milestone in our quest to advocate for the full integration of culture for international climate action. As you all know too well, in every part of the globe, culture and natural heritage sites are being threatened by bushfires, droughts, floods and storms that are increasing in both their frequency and intensity. The threat is real. One in three natural heritage sites is currently at risk. And if nothing is done, the coral they hold may disappear by the end of the century. The uprooting of communities due to climate change is also threatening entire ways of life. This includes the practice and transmission of living heritage, oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, and festive events. At the same time, rising seas um, threaten iconic sites such as Venice in Italy, Zanzibar in Tanzania, Rapa Nui in Chile, or Luang Prabang in Laos, while some others, such as Meroe in, in Sudan, uh, could be buried by encroaching deserts. The IPCC ECOMOS uh, UNESCO International Co-Sponsored Meeting on Culture, Heritage and Climate Change is timely. Placing culture at the heart of the global climate agenda can no longer be delayed and is in line with the request of the member states of UNESCO. Therefore, UNESCO was very pleased to join this initiative with ECOMOS, which is one of the three advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee and the IPCC. The initiative which aimed at identifying knowledge gaps regarding the connections of culture and heritage with climate change and at building new conversations and collaborations that will support future research and action in climate science adaptation and mitigation. Building on its housewide strategy of climate action and its declaration of ethical principles in relation to climate change, as well as its six widely ratified conventions in the field of culture, UNESCO has long been working to safeguard the world's tangible and intangible cultural heritage through both its World Heritage Convention and its 194 states parties and through its 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage and its 180 states parties from the effects of climate change, advancing the role of culture for climate change mitigation and adaptation, and its key role as a source of resilience. One of UNESCO's most noticeable actions uh, and ongoing works in this regard is the finalization of the policy document on climate action for world heritage, for which an open-ended working group of all 194 states parties to the World Heritage Convention will hold its second meeting tomorrow. Culture is more than just an asset. It is a fundamental resource to respond to the global crisis caused by climate change. It contributes greatly to people's well-being and is instrumental in crafting sustainable futures. A number of key messages stem out from the December meeting as reflected in detail in the Global Research and Action Agenda on Culture, Heritage and Climate Change. Among these, we could highlight the fact that to achieve an efficient global climate action, inclusive approaches to climate change informed by culture are necessary. A better understanding of the relation of culture and heritage to climate impacts 
Exposure and vulnerability is also needed. Research projects across the world now need to begin exploring how to best understand, articulate and manage losses. Sustainability and development create opportunities to create climate mitigation options and have implications for green transformation. Another important aspect that can be drawn from the international co-sponsored meeting is that culture and heritage can provide opportunities to introduce, develop and enhance adaptation approaches and strategies, cultural landscapes, living heritage, including oral traditions, and tangible heritage hold evidence of the human responses to, to, to past disasters, which may inspire culture-based strategies to facilitate adaptation to future changes. Last but not least, investing and supporting artistic and creative approaches can have co-benefits to communicate more broadly and effectively with regard to climate change. Progress has undeniably been made, however, addressing the impacts of climate change on heritage in this make or break period will require all of us to ensure that the outcomes of the international co-sponsored meeting um, help inform tangible solutions for integrating cultural and natural heritage into national climate policies and responses through multi-stakeholder collaboration and participatory processes. This meeting has allowed uh, to provide valuable data in this regard, which will help to fill gaps. They will no doubt feed the forthcoming international agenda, including Mondial Code 2022 and the next UNFCCC COP. Before concluding my address, I'd like to express UNESCO's appreciation to the two other co-sponsors of the international co-sponsored meeting, IPCC and ECOMOS, to the Scientific Steering Committee of this uh, initiative and to all the participants for their precious contributions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Joji, for your kind words and, of course, UNESCO's important contribution in this regard. So uh, the next and last welcome greetings from Tino Marga, president of ECOMOS Germany. Tino, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning, dear organizers, dear participants. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the German National Committee of ECOMOS. We are very pleased to be able to continue the expert dialogue on the topic of culture, cultural heritage and climate change, also thanks to the funding from the German Federal Environmental Foundation, DBU. Climate change is not only the greatest global challenge in the eyes of the younger generation, we could read that uh, from recent surveys, which also have been published in the media. This year's member survey by ICOMOS Germany also revealed that the relationship between cultural heritage and climate change is the most urgent issue that concerns our national circle of leading cultural heritage experts. And this relationship between cultural heritage and climate change is twofold. On the one hand, it is about the protection of cultural heritage from the consequences of climate change, for example, from devastating floods, or simply from small but certain for certain objects dangerous changes in air humidity. On the other hand, our cultural heritage can help us to understand what has worked sustainable over the centuries and for example from which constructional or urban planning solutions or from which cultural practices of the past we can learn in order to best meet the challenges ahead. Cultural heritage is therefore not only a fragile wealth worthy of protection, but also a knowledge resource that helps us to tackle present and future tasks. Climate change, climate protection is thus not a topic to which cultural heritage can somehow be extended, but an integral part of the engagement with cultural heritage. The dialogue between the disciplines is consequently a two-way discourse with mutual inspiration in both directions. In that sense, I wish us all an interesting event and an intensive exchange. So let's get straight to the content of our event, the introduction of the project itself, 
and the summary of the results of the international co-sponsored meeting on culture, heritage, and climate change. And now please to hand over the microphone to Will McGarry. He is rep representative of the e-commerce climate change working group and co-chair for the international co-sponsored meeting. Will, we're looking forward to hearing about the outcomes of the meeting. So the floor or rather the screen is yours. Great, thank you very much. And you know, and thank you um, to those wonderful welcomes which we've already uh, had today. Um, my name is, is Dr. Will McGarry um, and I was the ICOMOS co-chair uh, at the International Co-Sponsored Meeting on Culture, Heritage and Climate Change. Um, I was one of three co-chairs, one from each supporting organization, specifically uh, Dr. Jyoti Hustagrahar, who you've already heard from today from UNESCO, and Dr. Deborah Roberts from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. As co-chairs, our primary role was to lead the meeting scientific steering committee, which set the scientific agenda for the meeting. And today I would like to take a few minutes to provide an overview of the meeting to set the context for the presentations and discussions, which we will hear today and this afternoon. While here though, I would also like to take this opportunity to reiterate some thanks specifically to the DBU for their generous funding and support, which made the initiative possible and to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of the many, many, many individuals from each supporting organization who have worked tirelessly over the last two years. This specifically includes my two co-chairs, Dr. Jyoti Hosegrahar and Dr. Deborah Roberts. And I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Marcy Rockman and Dr. Mehtel Rossler, former director of the World Heritage Center, both of whom were instrumental in the early stages of this project. The proposal to hold an international co-sponsored meeting on culture, heritage and climate change was a response to growing calls from inter for international attention to culture, heritage and climate. These calls came from across the sector, including the heritage advisory bodies and the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. They were a recognition that significant gaps exist in understanding the role of culture and heritage in global climate science and in climate change action, and aim to put culture at the heart of the climate conversation. These calls were perhaps best expressed at the 40th session of the World Heritage Convention in 2016, which recommended that heritage organizations strengthen relations with the UNFCCC and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to work towards shared outputs addressing the relationship between heritage and climate change. A proposal for a meeting with IPCC co-sponsorship on this topic was first put forward by the International Council on Monuments and Sites in 2017. This was agreed by the co-chairs of the working groups of the IPCC and endorsed by the executive in June 2020. Co-sponsorship was then confirmed by UNESCO, resulting in the international co-sponsored meeting on culture, heritage and climate change, which took place in December 2021. The aim of this meeting was to take stock of the state of knowledge regarding the connections of culture, heritage with anthropogenic climate change, and to establish gaps in knowledge regarding these connections. Dr. Hannah Morell will discuss the scientific remit of the meeting in more detail shortly essential to meeting success was ensuring that participants were drawn from a wide range of backgrounds and knowledge systems representative of different backgrounds and cultures. So while it was originally envisioned that 90 participants would be selected from a long list of nominated experts for an in-person meeting in 2021, it rapidly became clear that this would not be possible due to the global health pandemic. So plans were made and put in place for a remote meeting supported by a participant website, which would allow meeting participants to access documents, share ideas, and engage in discussions as part of an ongoing and active community. These participants were chosen by the Meeting Scientific Steering Committee and came from 40 countries across six continents, with 40% of participants coming from the Global South. The meeting ran for a week from Monday to Friday. Of course, this made meeting times quite challenging, Discussion section, sessions, which took place on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, explore key themes at three sessions, two of which were repeated to facilitate participation from all time zones. 
Sessions were chaired by members of the meeting scientific steering committee and rapporteurs from the ICOMOS Emerging Professionals Working Group and UNESCO recorded discussions. Amongst participants, care was taken to ensure a gender balance and 61% of participants were women. A broad range of researchers and practitioners were present, consisting of 13 climate scientists, 78 cultural heritage and seven natural heritage science practitioners. Participants included members and representatives from indigenous peoples and also from local communities. This broad in involvement was really important because cultural heritage is about people and places. The meeting included many examples and case studies presented by participants in both poster and discussion sessions on Tuesday and Thursday and during the meeting session. These often touched on themes central to the meeting, which will be discussed by Dr. Morell shortly. They allowed the meeting to explore the often complex nature of climate change and its impact through a person and cultural centered lens, humanizing discussions and providing place-based examples and solutions. All of these discussions were recorded and fed into meeting outputs. Key and really central to meeting successes were the three white papers which were prepared by global teams of researchers in advance of the meeting. Drafts of these were made available to participants in advance of the meeting itself to provoke discussion and were also scoping exercises which allowed meeting organizers to set the agenda and identify key questions for discussion in meeting sessions. Dr. Morel will introduce these questions shortly but I would like to take this opportunity to encourage you to download these white papers, as well as the Meeting Global Research and Action Agenda, which are available on our website, the link for which is on the screen now, and we also posted it into the chat earlier. So now I would like to hand over to the International Co-Sponsored Meeting on Culture, Heritage and Climate Change Scientific Coordinator, Dr. Hannah Morell, who will provide an overview of the scientific remit of the meeting and further introduce the white paper presentations later today. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Will. Um, hi, it's really great to be here. And I really hope that our work can um, help you explore your own areas of expertise, skills and practices to better prepare for climate impacts and explore credible options as a response. Um, in my capacity as scientific coordinator for the project, which I took over from Dr. Marcy Rockman in the summer of last year, I just want to go through what we established as areas of focus and how the speakers you will hear from over the afternoon as leads and authors of three commissioned white papers that Will mentioned help shape conversations and considerations over this past year of the project. So as Will mentioned, we've just published uh, the Global Research and Action Agenda alongside three white papers. And this work has really um, been a combined effort to draw out key high level points raised during the December meeting. And if you've had the opportunity to go through these, at first glance, you may feel that uh, they might not apply to the German context, but I would urge you to think flexibly and creatively on each message as threaded throughout, what we really um, are promoting and uh, endorsing is the relevance of culture and heritage or your own expertise to climate discussions. Um, the importance of recognizing in decision-making and planning the role of diverse actors and groups, communities and peoples and what that recognition should look like. And, and the reality of how inequity and inaccessibility can create barriers to credible opportunities for meaningful transformations across mindsets, values, and systems. And so for Germany, um, there's room, for example, and I just you know, was brainstorming this a bit, but to consider identifying windows of opportunity or entry points in uh, thinking about how to influence management plans. So this could be resource, service, knowledge, or capacity gaps, uh, or areas our work in culture and heritage can align to, or um, including revisiting existing plans that might uh, no longer feel or be fit for purpose. And the hook is really to create a collaborative vision or frameworks to guide future actions, while also committing to those short term actions that might be essential or the best available options for the time being. And by way of example, um, but 
you know, but only um, uh, an example here are uh, windows of opportunities that could lie in considering Germany's disaster management, which is decentralized to the federal states, as you would know. So through this regional management, plans across the country use regional knowledge um, of behaviors or knowledge of land and waterscapes and other place-based insights and data. So the question is, how can our expertise or your expertise help strengthen these databases and data sets and um, monitoring networks being used, if at all? In terms of research, how can we help enhance understandings of the potential impact climate change has on people and contribute to conversations about what coordinated measures can help mitigate risk through prevention, protection and preparedness? We could think about how our research can better help understand vulnerability of critical infrastructure sectors, such as coastal and river floodplains, which are most vulnerable to climate change. Or, for example, we can think about how and where culture and heritage can sit in working with communities or harnessing our capacity to learn from the past in terms of early warning systems, better communication and preparedness across systems. And with increasing unpredictability and uncertainty of climate impact, more can be done here in terms of understanding community resilience and learning from the past, and we can help with that. And these windows of opportunity leave room for us to situate ourselves. So for example, disaster preparedness and adaptive pathways. We can explore our role in working towards understanding what is needed at a local level, identifying those resilience strengths and gaps, building community awareness and understanding potential options for resilience, such as what works and what doesn't at a community level. This includes exploring the role of culture and heritage in conversations and investing in pre preventing, reducing and managing risks that might lead to worse impacts before they happen. Knowledge sharing and development. We can think about where we sit in building that credibility locally through being able to showcase and share knowledge of diverse practices on the ground and facilitate that essential cross-sectoral partnership to solve a crisis that needs collaboration and cooperation and capacity building and learning specifically about resilience, what resilience is to different communities, how we can support research communities processes through clear quantitative and qualitative data evidence or measurements or of what resilience is. And finally, community engagement and cross sectoral collaboration. Culture and heritage are just so crucial to approaches that empower people and support them to identify solutions through their own priorities and perspectives. And we're also key in nurturing that systems thinking through a joint and holistic approach to better understand human and ecosystem interconnectedness. This includes what skills, knowledge, abilities, or processes we need and how we can advocate to ensure we have and can better develop them. So this is just a really quick overview of the meeting and topics covered. And uh, as this is being recorded, you'll have the opportunity to re review all of these slides in more detail. But here on the slide is what each white paper concentrated on. And I'm gonna just skip over this rather than read it out as uh, the white paper guest speakers that we have today will likely go over the areas that they've covered. But what we did uh, for the meeting is concentrate one full day to each of these three themes. So knowledge systems, impacts and solutions. And each day had three talking points which we addressed inspired by each white paper. So for the knowledge systems paper, the talking points were knowledge systems, power and interpretations of climate change, the new conditions, new knowledge uh, section, and then finally, the challenges and opportunities of integrating knowledge systems. The topics we explored for that day included the relevance of locality and value systems on uh, climate change thinking, existing inequities and inequalities that impact resilience and adaptive capacity, and opportunities and challenges of drawing on diverse systems of knowledge. Day three focused on impacts. And uh, from that white paper, we were inspired to discuss collective understandings of uncertainty, identifying common factors for vulnerability and resilience, and then impacts, power, and interpretations of climate change. 
So some of the topics that came from those discussions looked at long-term versus short-term impacts, the capacity to learn from the past in terms of distinguishing between natural cycles and human-made impacts, um, different perceptions of risk, and lastly, how governance systems influence or dictate approaches or concerns related to culture, heritage, and climate change. And finally, the white paper on transformative change and alternative sustainable futures, or shortened to solutions, uh, we discussed climate justice, impacts, and capacity building, and the power of heritage in climate thinking. So on that day, uh, the last day of the meeting, we explored challenges and opportunities of scaling up and scoping out, how to empower people for climate change, and uh, what we need to do to rethink or revisit heritage, climate, and policy frameworks, and how to enhance work on collaborative solutions, education, and literacies. So uh, that's an introduction of where we are in a nutshell. Um, and before I uh, introduce the white paper lead co-authors um, after the break here today, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge their work and the importance of their work and hope you get an opportunity to read through these papers as they each address the state of knowledge um, across culture, heritage and climate change in specific themes that they were given. And on the slide here, I have the lead and co-authors of each paper, uh, three of which are presenting today. But of course, it's essential, and I'd really like to highlight all contributing authors. Um, and as this is the first event we've done since the meeting last December altogether, I wanted to take the opportunity and the time to thank the teams again. So on the slide here is the Knowledge Systems uh, team, which includes Ibadan, Willie, Rosario, Deborah, Melissa, Victoria, Jennifer, Gideon, Andrew, and Petua. For impacts, Salma, Joanne, Maya, Michael, Christopher, Poonam, Patricia, John Baptiste, Tiffany, and Luxon. And for the impact, uh, for the sorry, for the solutions, uh, William, Moses, Joshua, uh, Christian, Oscar, Francisca, Schumann, Felix, A.R., Shandi, Pinde, and Alex. And uh, so I believe we have. Um, a, uh, a break coming soon. That's all from me. So perhaps I will, um, I will just stop now before I introduce Nick Simpson, who will be, who is co-lead, who will be speaking on the impacts paper. So thank you very much. Okay. So we are back at 11 o'clock with uh, the white papers and uh, Hannah, uh, I'm happy that you will moderate then the white paper sections. Okay, then thank you so much. Yes, we're back for uh, the white papers now. Um, so because I, I know that I keep on mentioning it in an order because they're white papers one, two, and three, but as uh, with white paper one, the knowledge systems, um, Professor Ben Orlov is in New York at the moment. So we've shifted it around to start with uh, the impacts paper, paper, white paper two. Um, so first up is Nick Simpson, co-lead author of the impacts paper. Nick's focus is on climate risks and response and, in, and is based at the African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town. Um, I believe Nick, you're doing this uh, solo without Scott? Is that um, Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, Scott will be uh, speaking to some of the slides halfway through. So let me introduce. OK, uh, Scott Orr is a heritage science engineer with a focus on the sustainable environment and is a lecturer in data um, heritage data science at UCL's Institute for Sustainable Heritage. So over to you, Nick. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone. Sorry for the, the delay to start. Um, so just to get going, I'd like to just acknowledge and, and thank the fantastic author team uh, that I got to work with on this project. Uh, firstly, Scott Orr, um, who was a co-lead on White Paper 2, uh, but also the contributing authors that, that Hannah mentioned earlier. And we are also grateful for the leadership and the funding that was provided for this project, a very important and underfunded uh, research area. Uh, first slide. 
to give a quick overview, um, white paper two covers five main themes. Um, Scott, if you can go to the next slide, uh, of research policy and practice, including review of coverage of heritage in recent reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, risk terminologies in heritage developed by UNESCO, ICOMOS, IUCN, ICROM, and other culture and heritage related organizations, and the IPCC used for potential crosswalk between the two fields. Um, the third uh, objective um, uh, is uh, to give a, an overview of types of and severity of impacts, vulnerability, and risks. Uh, also, the geographic distribution of impacts, vulnerability, and understanding of risks. And then an overview of existing tools for identification, monitoring, and comparison of the impacts, vulnerability, and understanding of risks to heritage from climate change. Um, we we closed the, the white paper with some reflection on the knowledge gaps and the next steps uh, covered. Um, Scott, I see, unfortunately, you're showing an older version. Yes, of... I, I was just thinking that. Let Give me one second. I think I can um, pull up the other one. My apologies. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking to the, the following slide, though. Um, our, our first big key message out of the white paper um, is that climate change is already impacting multiple types of heritage in all regions of the world. But climate change poses an existential threat to multiple dimensions of culture and heritage. Human-induced climate change is already producing weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. Climate hazards have become more severe as global warming has increased. Observed changes to the climate system include widespread and rapid impacts on the atmosphere, oceans, cryosphere, and biosphere, increasing the frequency and intensity of heat extremes, marine heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, and intense tropical cyclones, as well as reductions in Arctic sea ice, snow cover, glaciers, and permafrost. So the scope of this impacts white paper is extensive due to the diversity and quantity of heritage types and climate change impact types. Culture and heritage encompass natural and cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, including the creative economy and its cultural industries. Tangible heritage can be immovable and movable, Immovable cultural heritage includes archaeological sites, historic buildings, and museums, museum collections, archives, and represent movable, tangible heritage. Whereas intangible cultural heritage includes practices, representations, expressions, knowledges, and skills inherited from our ancestors and passed on to descendants. Natural heritage includes Ge geological features, ecosystems, and biodiversity, which support social ecological systems. Now, many of these dimensions of culture and heritage are physically exposed and vulnerable to climate hazards and potentially affected by direct and indirect impacts from climate change. Next slide. On the left, is a picture of Kilimanjaro, uh, Africa's largest mountain. And the top left shows the amount of snow and ice cover in 1993. The bottom left shows it in 2002. Uh, glaciers on the Rowenzori and Mount Kenya are also projected to disappear by 2030. And by 2040, it's projected that the remaining glaciers on Kilimanjaro will be lost. On the right, we have a picture of uh, 
a sugar bird in the, the Feinbos um, biome in, in the southern tip of Africa. Increasing temperatures of fresh waters, ocean and on land, heat waves, precipitation changes, both increases and decreases in precipitation, increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, sea level rise, ocean acidification, have all led to local or global extinction of species and reduced potentially irreversible loss of ecosystems and their services, including on freshwater and land and ocean ecosystems. So for natural sites, future projections of biodiversity components of natural heritage are extremely concerning. For example, above 1.5 degrees, half of the assessed species of the IPCC are projected to lose over 30% of their population or area of suitable habitat. At two degrees Celsius, 36% of freshwater fish species are vulnerable to local extinction in Africa. Now, these are very concerning findings. Next slide. Future climate change poses increased risk to heritage globally, including losses and damage to heritage of current and future generations, and particularly severe impacts on intangible cultural heritage of indigenous communities. Our every region of the world is projected to increasingly experience concurrent and multiple changes as a result of global warming, with the potential for accumulative impacts on heritage. For example, hundreds of thousands of significant archaeological, cultural, and natural heritage sites along the global coast of every continent are potentially threatened by sea level rise. Many at current rates of warming, will be lost or damaged. Importantly, what have been considered low likelihood but high consequence outcomes, including tipping points such as ice sheet collapse, abrupt ocean circulation changes, and some compound extreme events, can also pose a risk to heritage. These major events may produce substantially larger impacts than those currently within IPCC assessments and are now within the likely range of future warming. Next slide. Recent research has shown that small island heritage sites are especially at risk. This is the Aldabra Atoll, the world's second largest coral atoll that has recently been assessed to have 28% of its area exposed to extreme sea levels by 2100. Next slide shows Cardo Maximus, part of the World Heritage Site Tipasa in Algeria. It will also likely see more than 10% of its site exposed to extreme sea levels by 2100 at high emissions scenarios. Next slide. Climate variability and climate change is also important. This is the Great Mosque at Jenne, and as an example of unique and sustainable architecture characterized by area-specific traditional earthen materials and associated indigenous knowledge systems and technology. The earthen materials used by generations of masons to maintain the site provide advantages in thermal conductivity, resistivity and diffusivity indoor and outdoor, to indoor and outdoor temperatures, as well as cooling and heating capacities. Moreover, these earthen materials are recyclable and environmentally cleaner because of the absence or small quality of cement in the production process thus reducing carbon emissions. Despite these advantages, the expertise and social cultural ceremonies that accompany building and renewal of earthen architecture are disappearing fast, in part due to extreme climate variability. Increased variability in rainfall and temperature has increased risk to the Jenne Mosque and the town's traditional building methods. 
low and highly variable rainfall affects mud quality, which has affected the re-mudding ceremonies. So this particularly highlights how climate-related impacts on tangible heritage are interconnected and compound with impacts from climate change on intangible heritage. Next slide. Climate change impacts on heritage are not being studied consistently nor systematically. And this is reflected in heritage coverage in recent IPCC assessments and special reports to date. Next slide. The IPCC was created to provide policymakers with regular scientific assessments on climate change, its implications and potential future risks, as well as put forward adaptation and mitigation options. These reports highlighted here in, in the more recent IPCC rounds, not including the latest uh, six assessment report reports, um, prepare comprehensive assessment reports about the state of scientific knowledge on climate change. They have engaged with heritage and its respective literatures, including information on archaeological and historical investigation, ethnographies and indigenous local and traditional knowledge systems and practices. But it was not until the fifth assessment report, 2014, that more substantive heritage aspects were considered. Across all the fifth assessment reports, discussions of heritage assessment references impacts from climate change on cultural and natural landscapes, indigenous peoples, and the use of traditional practices. But more recently, in the, in the special reports associated with the sixth assessment round, the IPCC included cultural heritage as a part of tourism, which includes tourism to heritage places and forms a key part of the creative economy. The IPCC special report on climate change and land includes attention to land governance, which includes rights of indigenous peoples and local communities' abilities to continue traditional lifeways, genetic heritage of traditional, traditionally managed species, and heritage losses that can result from conflicts over forest management and as an outcome of land degradation. The special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate, along with its attention to social values, also recognizes that non-economic losses of climate change include impacts on intrinsic and spiritual attributes of high mountain landscapes, the interconnectedness of land, water, and ice for culture, livelihoods, and well-being in the Arctic, and that losses of local and indigenous knowledge associated with cultural heritage limits the ability of all to recognize impacts beyond, sorry, and respond to changes in the ocean and cryosphere. The SROC also highlights, sorry, the SROC also raises issues of loss and damage to heritage and managed retreat and resettlement. So giving a quick overview of uh, the range of heritage types assessed in IPCC reports prior to AR6, the sixth assessment report. Next slide. Uh, we see that UNESCO cultural and natural sites have been covered. There's been attention to glaciers, biodiversity hotspots, coral reefs, landscapes, environmental and cultural heritage, and indigenous peoples. Next slide. The range of climate hazards that have been identified to particularly affect heritage include sea level rise, tropical storms, hurricanes, cyclones, increased global average warming of temperatures, flood outbursts, landslides, coastal erosion, heat stress, drought, and wildfire. In general, next slide, the impact types include forced displacement, destruction of cultural heritage, burnt areas, extinctions, and loss of outstanding universal value attributes of sites. Next slide. The impacts specific to indigenous communities has seen a lot of attention 
um, and, for example, include um, negative impacts on their sovereignties, food systems, and food security. Next slide. Across the geographies of impact, um, low-lying coastal areas are particularly at risk. Small island developing states are included. Snow and ice-covered peaks of mountain regions, dry lands, the Arctic, and shallow seas have seen a lot of attention. Next slide. Most recently, in the sixth assessment report, the Africa chapter has had a dedicated section, the first dedicated section to heritage. And the executive summary statement arising out of that assessment was that African cultural heritage is already at risk from climate change, including sea level rise and coastal erosion. But most African heritage sites are neither prepared for nor adapted to future climate change. Next slide. There has been increasing attention and interest in the idea of loss and damages, loss and damage and losses and damages to heritage from climate change. In the most recent IPCC assessment report, the, the concentration landed on understanding of losses and damages, but an increasingly important theme of research going forward would be to concentrate on quantifying and uh, validating uh, loss and damage from climate change for natural and cultural heritage sites, particularly with regard to allocating differentiated responsibilities for that losses and damages. Next slide. One of our tasks was to look at different uses of conceptualizations of risk in the heritage literature and the IPCC. And we found that across the heritage literatures, there was quite a diverse and less strict usage of the term risk and its components than that used in the IPCC, which is to be expected because the IPCC risk framework is quite highly um, uh, developed and controlled. But this figure shows an evolution in the IPCC understanding of risk from the fifth assessment report to the sixth assessment report and the future of the IPCC risk framework, which now includes the idea of responses and how responses might affect risk. And integrating response is important for heritage adaptation to climate change as it highlights the consequences of a lack of response to climate change or inappropriate or ineffective responses which do not reduce risk or responses that might lead to maladaptation or increased vulnerability for certain populations. But importantly, it also shows how adaptation and mitigation responses can reduce risk for heritage. For example, Vestukas et al. recently this has just shown that emissions mitigation from a high emission scenario to a medium emission scenario can reduce the number of African heritage sites that are highly exposed to extreme sea levels by 25% by 2100. And more rapid reduction in emissions, keeping us below a two degree global warming will potentially save more. Also across many contexts across the world, some of the most significant gains for risk reduction from climate change for heritage can involve responses that target reduction in vulnerability and exposure beyond the prevailing concentration on hazards. There is quite a lot in white paper too that focuses on the different framings of risk, hazard exposure, vulnerability, loss and damage, mitigation and adaptation across heritage and IPCC framings. And I'd recommend um, you take some time to have a look at them and one of our conclusions is that further conceptual integration between the two fields is necessary 
to facilitate transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approaches to climate risk assessment for heritage going forward, because at the moment, they don't speak the same language. I'm going to take a break here, and Scott is going to speak to the geographic distribution of impacts of climate change on heritage on the next slide. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, in our assessment, we found that there is a global imbalance in the number of publications assessing the impacts on, of climate change on heritage between different regions. And I think crucially here, it's important to understand that this is not an imbalance in the impacts themselves, but rather in the state of knowledge on what these impacts are, where they are occurring, and what they will cause. Uh, for example, in our assessment of cultural heritage literature, which accounts for 13% of the publications assessed, uh, this research is concentrated, uh, focusing on Europe and North America. For example, 56% of the cultural climate change and heritage literature occurs in those areas. Uh, we see a similar bias uh, in natural heritage, for which Europe accounts for 25% of the quantity of natural heritage papers included in our review. Uh, particularly, there is little research that represents our understanding of the state of knowledge uh, of the impacts of climate change on heritage in South America, Africa, and in small island developing states. And I think that reinforces points that Nick has already raised. Um, interestingly, uh, despite continental or perhaps economic co contrasts, even within kind of regional, national, and subnational uh, areas, there are disparities that are observed. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, Africa as a continent, we see an emphasis placed on tangible heritage in North Africa. And this stands in contrast to a lot of the other research and our, the state of knowledge uh, in Africa as a continent, which is looking more broadly at intangible heritage and the synergies between them. One of the things that we also observed was a, a prevalence in the literature to be national focused, i.e. to be looking at the impacts of climate change on heritage at a national level. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for cross-germination of approaches to mitigation and assessing risks and opportunities for knowledge exchange across different nations and regions. Um, I don't have time to go into it, but if you are interested, chapter six of white paper two includes more detailed analysis of the state of knowledge for specific regions, uh, systematically looking across the world. And I highly encourage everyone to go and have a look at those. And perhaps most importantly, it is difficult to know if what we understand about the impact of climate change on heritage is a reflection of where science is being funded and undertaken and researched more broadly rather than where or when heritage is being affected by climate change. If we look, for example, at the distribution of first author affiliations of the publications that we reviewed for climate change and natural heritage literature, we, show the highest, we see the highest concentrations of authors based in China, Australia, the United Kingdom, Brazil, the USA, and Alaska as a, um, as a subregion of the USA. And of course, one of the challenges here is understanding whether this is, uh, whether this is a, a reflection of our understanding of the state of knowledge on the impacts of climate change in this region, but perhaps more fundamentally identifying where knowledge is being generated, where research is being driven, and therefore where the centers of thought leadership are in the realm of climate change and heritage. And we see similar trends when it comes to publications pertaining to cultural heritage and um, particularly focused on Italy, the United Kingdom, Germany, the United States of America, and perhaps a few other regions as well, including Australia. When we look at something like the state of conservation information system uh, used to understand change in World Heritage Sites, uh, since 1985, 89 World Heritage Sites were impacted by climate change, according to this monitoring system. 27% uh, of these were situated in Africa. Uh, what is interesting is that of these 89 World Heritage Sites that have been included on the list in danger since 1985, uh, although currently there are only 52 sites, it is that 14 of these were listed because of the impacts of climate change. 
So the list of danger intends to increase international awareness of the threats and encourage counteractive measures and international cooperation. And among the 14 sites in danger by climate change, there is a predominance of cultural sites, particularly in this. Uh, and it's worthwhile to know that Africa and the Middle East have the highest number of World Heritage Sites currently in danger from climate change. And I think one of the challenges herein, which is not a reflection of just of the state of conservation information system, but more broadly of the frameworks uh, that we use to understand the impacts on different aspects of heritage value, is that, uh, for example, with the World Heritage Convention, is that if climate change is not impacting the outstanding universal value of a particular World Heritage Site, it may not be picked up on this. And it draws to question uh, how we identify the relevant values associated with heritage in order to understand the relevant impacts. One more final slide on the geographic distribution of impacts to cultural heritage. Uh, this figure shows uh, the reporting, deliberation and certification patterns for 238 natural and mixed heritage sites. Um, it's important to note that the World Heritage Threats reporting and the in danger listing process are not a comprehensive record of climate risks to, her to World Heritage sites. So for example, in a 2020 analysis of these 238 sites, uh, it was revealed that there are at least 41 natural sites that have never been certified as in danger, despite reported threats that are equal to or higher intensity than those that have been certified as in danger. And this draws us then to the emergence of technically in danger natural world heritage sites. Um, these include places, for example, such as the Great Barrier Reef, which has been severely impacted by climate change in recent years, but remains off the list in danger. Uh, and indeed, various authors have shown systematic underreporting of climate impacts across all reefs. And again, I want to iterate this and emphasize that this is not a criticism of any particular individual framework, but rather, I think, emphasizing the need to revisit the various assessment and monitoring frameworks we have for the impacts of climate change on heritage and ensuring they are fit for purpose more broadly. When we look at the tools for assessing the impacts of climate change on heritage, we need to consider the different elements of the IPCC risk framework that Nick very helpfully introduced earlier on in this presentation. And when we look at something like the vulnerability of heritage to climate change, we see a long history of understanding the relationship between heritage and its environments, be that the impact of the physical environment on physical heritage or heritage in its urban or social or cultural contexts. And indeed, I would make the case that there is a, a long history of understanding these relationships and that vulnerability of heritage to climate change is one of the things that we know most about. And perhaps what is a missing link is, the, is then the interconnection between that and understanding the specific hazards and how they manifest locally and globally, and also the exposure assessment and our understanding of the characteristics of heritage that are relevant for understanding these impacts. It's also interesting to note that there's a lack of bespoke monitoring tools and methods for the investigation of physical impacts for heritage. And there's an opportunity to develop these. And I think what's particularly interesting here is that the tools for assessing performance are driven by the priorities of the original um, um, the original intents for which they were developed. And it draws to question about whether these are comprehensive and meeting the requirements for understanding the impacts of climate change on heritage. When we look at social and cultural vulnerability, this is primarily assessed using social science and qualitative methods, but it remains dominated by Western approaches to knowledge generation and a lack of appreciation for the role of local understanding of vulnerability. And I suspect this is something that will be touched on far more when the lead author of White Paper One speaks about knowledge systems and heritage contexts. But I think it's interesting to note that participatory approaches to investigation of the impacts of climate change on heritage, for example, including citizen science, have been used to study the, the slow onset of events related to climate change in various parts of the world. And one of the things that was recognized in this work was the importance of local and indigenous knowledge in climate research, but that the role of local observations wasn't fully recognized. And there was a need to develop structures for the incorporation of local observations of climate change. Uh, and these need to be equally weighted whilst being understood in their own context. One final slide on tools for assessing the impacts of climate change on heritage is that in our review, we found that 
Although relatively infrequently applied for heritage and climate change, there are, are, there are opportunities to apply existing mixed vulnerability assessment tools. Uh, these include tools like scenario-based models, such as the dynamic interactive vulnerability assessment for integrated assessment of coastal zones produced by the EU-funded DNAST Coast Consortium. And this can be applied globally, but also locally. Uh, there are indicator-based systems, such as Erosion, an initiative for sustainable coastal erosion management in Europe, uh, or for example, the Deduced Project that defines 27 different indicators for sustainable development. And again, these can be applied in, in multi-scale approaches. And finally, we have index-based methods, uh, for example, the multi-scale coastal vulnerability index that integrates the characteristics of coastal regions, coastal forcing, as well as data representing socioeconomic uh, contexts. It's worth noting here that there are heritage-specific vulnerability frameworks that exist and have been developed and are now being applied in various parts of the world. These tend to focus on physical impacts and long-term change. And there's an opportunity to develop frameworks for the impacts of climate change on intangible heritage, as well as understanding extreme events and the impacts of climate change in disasters and the relevant consequences for heritage. I'm now going to pass it back to Nick for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Um, so the next slide uh, gives uh, a quick snapshot of a few quite influential studies from covering the exposure and risk of heritage sites. But as you can see from this selection, at the moment uh, from the climate literature, uh, the concentration has been on sea level rise and its associated hazards. And there's been much less focus uh, to date on uh, broader hazards and their, their impacts, as well as less emphasis on vulnerability and responses to climate change. Next slide. This chart uh, gives a, a quick snapshot of the distribution, um, the unequal distribution of climate change heritage knowledge creation that Scott was speaking to a little bit earlier. And it shows that the number of English language papers on cultural heritage for different geographic regions and regions of first authors of climate change heritage research. Um, and just like those maps earlier showed, you can see uh, there is a, an interesting um, arrangement of who is doing research on where. Likewise, next slide, on cultural heritage, the, the distributions are also quite peculiar uh, to focus largely on Europe and North America, uh, which doesn't reflect the global uh, endowment of heritage. Next slide. In a recent study uh, on decolonial approaches to climate change heritage research, it was shown that the unequal distribution of UNESCO World Heritage Sites reflects colonial patterns. Um, and next slide, we are at a crossroads in the climate change heritage research where there is an opportunity for an embrace of transformational, inter and transdisciplinary and decolonial principles to address the range of research and practice challenges as the field matures. Despite recent interest in decolonizing heritage research and decolonial approaches, um, they are not yet widely established in the climate change nor the heritage scholarship and practice. Recognizing that Colonization led to a Euro-American centricity, dispossession, racism, and ongoing power imbalances and how climate change research is produced and used is an important first step. The next step is committing to actively undoing those systems and ways of thinking through transformation to agenda setting, funding of research, training, access to data, and governance. Next slide. 
So in conclusion, the white paper covered cultural and natural heritage in the IPCC reports. Uh, number two, understanding of climate risk to heritage. Three, the types, diversity, and severity of impacts of climate change for heritage. Four, the geographic distribution of climate impacts as the literature currently reflects it. Five, some the existing tools for assessing climate change impacts on heritage. And then we close with knowledge gaps and next steps. And we would love it if you got into the report and engaged with it deeply, but we're also very open to respond to any questions arising from this presentation now. Thank you for your time. I was saying thank you very much, uh, Nick and Scott, and we have about seven or so minutes uh, for questions from the floor. If there are any, if you could raise your hand, I can see it on the side, and then um, you can unmute yourself and ask if there are any if there are any questions. Uh, Alexandra Cruz. Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for giving me the floor. And first of all, I have to say thank you to the organizers and to this uh, extremely important and inspiring um, um, conference. And uh, now I, I would like to address to, to um, Nick Simpson and, and Scott Orr, uh, your presentation was not only extremely informative and inspiring, unfortunately, it was, was also disappointing <laughs> because if I summarize correctly, the knowledge is there. It is already prepared and accessible for different groups, especially for politicians. However, what we are really missing is to come to an environmental and cultural heritage friendly and saving behavior. And so I definitely hope that uh, like Hannah Morrill said in her introduction, that uh, now it is on us to, to find the way to use all this and to bring it to the right people and to come into action. And it would be wonderful if the today meeting helps us to do so. So this is not really a question. It's just, I'm absolutely amazed by what I have seen and heard so far. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, over to uh, Lola, if you have a question and bear in yeah. mind, we do have uh, four to five minutes. Up. Thank well, you. I would say I have a remark and I, I would like really support the message that we need a trans transdisciplinary research between the climate scientists and cultural heritage scientists. And even we are working now in Europe, I don't see, I don't say about the countries in Africa, but even in Europe, we see two bubbles. I would say there are two bubbles between the climate scientists and cultural heritage. Now I'm working in the project in Germany in Kenya, so we try to understand the impact of climate change on cultural heritage. And it's clearly visible that the people really need the information not about the entire country, they really need the climate information focus on their particular cultural heritage site. Maybe you have the information for the, for the uh, Dome of Cologne or for, for San Susi Park because they're really large objective, but we have a small chapel in Bavaria, so which also needs a treatment. And I would say, so I, I support this trans, trans, how to say, interdisciplinary research between many disciplines. And I would like that, how to say, that we move together with two communities of climate sciences and cultural heritage to move together and try to understand which information is required. What is the most urgent issues and how we solve it by ourselves. Thank you. Um, I'm, and hopefully you'll be discussing that later this afternoon. I have a question just before I see two hands up, but um, Jörg Haspel had put a question in the chat. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, it is, what is the role that world heritage sites, natural, cultural, mixed properties can play in the context of climate change? Can this selection of globally outstanding valuable sites have an indicator function for the whole range of cultural and natural heritage, uh, followed by could could they or should they play a model for adaptive protective measurements and measures less highly appreciated uh, cultural and natural goods? So that's in the chat to um, Scott or Nick. Um, yeah, I, I can try to respond to that. It's quite a big question, um, but uh, just to say, um, 
some some of the conversations I've had coming out of this work has been fascinating to see that heritage discussions are a very new, potentially novel entry point for climate action. Um, often climate activists find it difficult to communicate to audiences that are not open to their domain of interest and concern of climate change and its impacts. Whereas more broadly, and we've seen this in the way that the media has picked up some of this work, uh, there is great interest in heritage, natural, cultural, biocultural, and it seems to be a shared value that we have and a shared concern for loss and damage of those heritage sites. So this is really, you know, a horn that we can blow, a trumpet um, to to raise greater climate action, greater awareness of the impacts of climate change on domains of value that are of great, broad, universal interest to civilization as we know it. Um, so I think I think in the in the impact side, there's there's new conversations that can happen that go beyond the current uh, framing of IPCC climate impacts, but more using heritage as an entry point uh, for broader interest. But also, um, when we're talking to the question on, on adaptation, um, many heritage sites are situated within uh, biologically and ecologically at-risk areas, and ecosystem-based and nature-based approaches to their adaptation can be flagship responses to climate change uh, and potentially uh, a great way to mobilize um, uh, exemplar adaptation uh, for, for those heritage sites. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, if, if uh, forgive me, we'll be eating a tiny bit into the break time. Uh, just Dorothy, I see your hand is up. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, I have read the white paper already, and uh, there is a call that climate change considerations need to be integrated into heritage, heritage impact assessments or environmental impact assessments. Can you explain this or give us an example? It's a really uh, question in detail, but perhaps we can uh, use it for our German uh, considerations. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, this actually speaks to some, some other work I've been doing around the integration of climate change considerations in uh, local level decision-making structures. For example, those that are mandated by legal or guideline requirements like environmental impact assessment. And currently, um, although climate change is often considered a background environmental condition uh, that might be considered for EIA, uh, across the world, there are very few environmental impact assessment regimes where there are legally binding regulations and practitioner guidance material to adequately integrate climate impacts on heritage sites at the local level. And um, there is, yeah, it, the door is wide open uh, for that kind of regulatory reform uh, that would drive in, in almost a fulcrum level effect, uh, greater attention to climate change at the site specific uh, work for, for heritage, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. I did see uh, previously Jyoti's hands up, but I think her connection has died on her. So um, I'll uh, convene this um, uh, this session of the of the conference, and um, if we can all come back in twelve minutes, that would be great. Thank you so so much, Nick and Scott. It was great to have you present. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, so up next is um, Nick Shepard. He's an associate professor um, of archaeology and heritage studies at Aarhus University and a, um, 
an extraordinary professor um, at the University of Pretoria with a focus on uh, environmental humanities, critical heritage studies, and uh, de- and post-colonial thinking um, on archaeology. He is away at the moment, uh, but he has pre-recorded his presentation, and we have contributing author uh, Joshua Cohen here today, whose area of expertise it includes uh, water and climate heritage. So after the presentation is, um, is, is viewed, feel free to field any questions that you might have to Joshua. Um, so it's the same, it's the same setup as before. Uh, so if we could have Nick's presentation. Hello, my name is Nick Shepard. Um, I'm lead author of the white paper on the role of cultural and natural heritage for climate action. Um, I'm going to spend 15 minutes or so giving some context and background and introducing the paper to you. Um, and my sincere apologies that I'm not able to be with you in person. Um, so our brief for the white paper was quite open. We were asked to think about um, how culture and heritage can contribute to finding solutions for the climate emergency. And if we extrapolate that out a little bit, um, the brief is in terms of what is the role of the humanities and social sciences in, um, in a debate and in a search for solutions, which up to now very largely has leaned towards um, the techno sciences. So um, a starting point for, uh, for, for us in preparing the white paper was the understanding that um, both techno-scientific solutions and policy are inevitably going to be mediated by a complex set of social, historical, cultural, and economic factors. Um, I think we've seen this in the recent uh, pandemic, the recent and ongoing pandemic, um, at every point, uh, the rush to find uh, viable vaccines, the distribution of vaccines, um, the uptake of vaccines, uh, as it were, the, the technological fix was mediated, was uh, conditioned by a complex set of, of factors. And in each case, we needed to understand what those social, political, economic, and cultural factors were. And um, many of us suspect that uh, this will also be the case with um with the climate emergency um and uh and the the rush to find solutions and implement wise policies so that was the first starting point a second starting point for us was um to understand the contemporary historical moment as something of an historical hinge in other words as a, as a kind of a turning point one of those moments where um where history itself turns and marks a distinctive before and after um, I think that many of us feel this. We, we understand the moment to be one of extraordinary uh, precarity, vulnerability, and uncertainty. Factors pile on one another. Um, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, the war in Ukraine, um, the crisis around global food supply, the increasing frequency of um, extreme weather events, um, I think many of us understand that uh, that business as usual approaches are no longer enough and that we need to be bold, we need to be free in our thinking, we need to be creative in our thinking. And um, the time is now really to address the issue of the climate emergency and in a serious way and to find solutions. Um, so that was a second starting point um, in preparing the white paper. I'll speak briefly to the approach that we took. So um, I was very fortunate to work with a distinguished group of, um, of researchers and practitioners. Um, as lead author, I had a relatively free hand in, um, in choosing the, the scientific team um, for the white paper. It was important for me that this team should be diverse um, in every respect, um, race, gender, nationality, uh, global North, Global South, Indigenous, Non-Indigenous. Um, we needed to hear from a range of voices, and uh, we needed to 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 hear from um, from experts in their respective fields. So um, the approach that we decided to take collectively was a case study approach. Um, so the white paper is built around um, eight quite detailed case studies. 
um, drawn from a wide range of disciplines and from um, a wide range of uh, dis uh, indigenous knowledge holders and disciplinary scientists. Um, and then uh, the second decision that we made in relation to the approach was to, um, to conclude the white paper with 11 talking points. So white papers customarily, as you will know, are policy leaning documents, um, and they often uh, conclude with a set of recommendations. Um, uh, part of our brief, part of the brief that we were given was the intention that this white paper should act as a kind of a provocation for further discussion and debate. Um, and in keeping with that part of the brief, we decided that rather than making um, open and shut recommendations, we would prefer to end with a set of 11 talking points. Each talking point is intended to provide um, the kernel or the seed for further debate, further discussion. Um, uh, I want to go on to speak about um, three key takeaways um, from this white paper. So you can read um, the talking points in detail. Uh, there's a very extensive literature review. Um, you can read the case studies, which individually are fascinating. Um, but I, I wanted to spend my brief time with you by talking about three key takeaways. Um, at least for me. Uh, the first of these is the importance of thinking outside of an accustomed set of frameworks and understandings, um, the frameworks and understandings that we've all grown up with, that we've all uh, internalized as, as researchers working in the disciplines in which we work. Um, we it got these, these frameworks go by a variety of names, you know, let's, let's call them modern, uh, perhaps, um, perhaps Western, a contested term, who knows what it means. Um, but we, we get a general sense of what these things are. Um, they hark back to developments um, in Europe in the, the 17th and 18th century, the Enlightenment, the secularization of society, the way in which um, science becomes very important, um, the development of certain forms of production, um, and indeed as well, historical events like colonialism, imperialism, racial slavery, and so on. The grand sweeping events of, of modernity of the last 500 years. So, um, so the importance of thinking outside of these frameworks. And this is where uh, local indigenous and traditional ontologies and epistemologies, ontologies, ways of being, epistemologies, ways of thinking, forms of knowledge become, I think, crucially important. Um, for, for the following very good reason, um, many people have argued that uh, the climate emergency itself is um, one of the legacies of, of modernity, if you will. It's the legacy of a particular relationship that we have um, to the world that supports us. Um, it's a relationship based on extractivist logics. Um, it's a relationship based on a fundamental division between culture and nature. Um, it's part of uh, the double edge, the dual legacy of, of modernity. On the one hand, modernity has given us amazing gifts. Um, on the other hand, it is it has brought, um, you know, as it were, the, 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 the issue of the climate emergency that, that we now deal with. So we need to look outside of these frameworks. We need to be inspired by ways of being, ways of thinking, understandings of our relationship to the natural world, to to the earth, to other beings um, that come from outside of, um, of, of these accustomed frameworks. Um, so hence the, the, the emphasis in the white paper on, um, on uh, local and indigenous ontologies and epistemologies. Um, I think the idea here is not that we should um, try to recreate these life worlds, that we should try to um, embrace the values of hunter-gatherers, um, rather that we should be inspired by them, um, that we should take very seriously, I think, the kinds of logics that inform those life worlds. A second takeaway, key takeaway, is the importance of foregrounding a climate justice perspective in everything that we do. Um, I think that uh, 
when it came to compiling the white paper and the talking points, every one of us on the team was in agreement that without fronting, without forefronting a climate justice perspective, um, any measures, any policies, any solutions are likely to falter. Um, so uh, the climate emergency itself has a history. Um, it's um, uh, the, the, the emissions crisis is um, largely the work of um, a, a cluster of developed nations. Um, it's largely taken place in the last couple of hundred years. Um, climate scientists talk about the Great Acceleration, the period post the Second World War, and then again post-1970, where we can see emissions uh, taking off. So the graph curves steeply upwards. And of course, um, the, the, the economies, the nations, the territories responsible for these emissions cluster in particular locations, um, very largely in the global north and increasingly now in the global east. Um, at the same time, it's very largely nations, territories, populations in the global south who are bearing um, the immediate costs of, of, um, of the climate emergency. Um, we face the, the real possibility of reproducing inequality on a global scale, on a kind of uh, climate apartheid. And um, that, that's, that's something that we want to avoid at all costs, I think. Um, the, the climate emergency is not only or even primarily um, an emergency for, uh, for um, life worlds, natural worlds, and life systems on, on the Earth, um, as it's often portrayed. Um, it's also a, a humanitarian crisis, um, and it's a test of our common humanity. Um, and uh, forefronting a climate justice perspective um, uh, becomes uh, absolutely key um, to thinking through how it is that we approach and implement solutions. Um, uh, the climate emergency, as many commentators uh, have noted, is um, a collective action problem. Um, it's no use solving the problem in Germany uh, or in Denmark or indeed in South Africa or the US, um, if we don't at the same time solve it uh, more generally, which means we have to evolve ways of thinking, ways of working, understandings of collective action and solidarity, um, which currently are quite poorly developed. Um, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a social political problem that faces us, and it's gonna be key to, um, to any solutions. That we uh, that we propose, and then um, the third takeaway um, is um, is the importance of imagination. Um, so uh, before we can um, work towards um, any future, we first of all have to imagine that future into being. Um, as an educator, as a pedagogue, as a researcher, as somebody who spends time in the classroom with young people. Um, increasingly, I've noticed what I would call um, uh, a crisis of hope. Um, so increasingly amongst young people, uh, I see um, anger, uh, I see anxiety, um, I see uh, a lack of belief in, in a viable future. Um, and this manifests in different ways. It manifests in a kind of denialism. Um, but uh, it also manifests in, 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 in a deep depression, in an anxiety, um, in a kind of nihilism. Um, it's, it's all messed up. What, what do we do? How do we solve the problem? The scale of, of the problem is so big. Where do we begin? Um, and I think that's a very, very concerning state of affairs. Um, uh, we need urgently to, um, to imagine viable futures into being. Um, at the moment, what we have um, are uh, Hollywood blockbusters imagining apocalypse. Um, uh, I, I, th I think this is, this is not exciting, it's not viable, it's not where we want to end up. Um, so this business of uh, the role of imagination um, uh, calls into question um, or calls forth um, the importance of the creative arts, it calls forth the importance of the humanities, it calls forth the importance of um, 
of really thinking in open creative ways about the kinds of futures that uh, we want for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren, for future generations. Um, and then um, working in concerted ways to achieve those futures. Um, a few points in conclusion. Um, I've already said that uh, the, the climate emergency is a test of our common humanity, as, as indeed it is. Um, it's tempting to want to erect fences and walls to, to put up the borders um, to keep you know, to keep the climate migrants out. I understand that that's tempting. Um, it's going to be increasingly difficult for us to do this. It's also increasingly going to be, I think, a way of compromising um, any sense of, uh, of a shared humanity that we have and that we want to hold on to. In the years to come, it's going to be increasingly difficult to um, ignore the plights of territories and populations. Um, uh, what do we do? What do we say? Uh, oh, the floods in Pakistan. Oh, uh, the food crisis in the Horn of Africa. Oh, the crisis in Southern Africa. Um, and then we say, oh, but it, uh, we're okay. Um, and and that gesture of saying, oh, but we're okay, I think I think begins to compromise something um, that 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 we don't want to to compromise. Um, in in short, our common humanity. So this this act of compromising common humanity extends not only as it were geographically horizontally it also spreads vertically into the future the decisions we make now will impact very directly on the lives and possibilities and aspirations of all future generations to come um, our children their children their children's children and so it goes um, and uh, we need desperately to evolve ways of thinking and forms of accountability that allow us to think forward, to take responsibility for those generations that will come after us. Um, and that is something that, frankly, we don't, we don't have at the moment. We don't possess that in abundance as a human faculty. So um, we're faced with enormous challenges. Uh, the language of heritage gives us a way of addressing some of these challenges. Um, I'll conclude with a few remarks on heritage. Um, heritage is many things. Uh, in, in its one iteration, it is that which we inherit from the past and pass on to the future. So it, it speaks to legacies. It speaks to a conversation across time and across generations, a kind of transgenerational conversation. And that's precisely the kind of conversation we need to be having now. Climate change itself is a kind of legacy issue. Um, it's something that in some ways we've inherited from the past that we are contribu contributing to in, in, in the present and that we hand on to the future. In other words, the climate emergency is, is at its heart a, a heritage issue. Heritage is other things as well. Um, it, it, it contains a key duty of care, which I, th I think is a, is, a, is a very useful um thought idea to work with that notion of a duty of care at the heart of heritage i think increasingly we are confronted with that duty of care and understanding the implications of that duty of care what it means and how the accountabilities of that duty of, of care unfold heritage gives us a language and a way of thinking a way of being which allows us in some ways to approach that duty of care. And then the third and final aspect of the notion of heritage is the idea of, if I can put it this way, accumulated human wisdom. Accumulated human wisdom. It's the, the best and the brightest, all of those achievements and things that we have as a species put in place, managed, achieved over, you know, let's say the course of the Holocene, the last 10,000 years. Um, and it's the idea that, that we carry this with us as a legacy, a precious legacy, an accumulation of wisdom, if you will, a kind of an archive, a species archive, a civilizational archive. And I think with the climate emergency, with the pressing issues 
of the climate emergency with the kind of existential threat that the climate emergency poses to us, the idea is that we need to look to this species archive, to the civilizational archive, in a moment of threatfulness to find solutions, to find inspiration, to find a way forward. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, and again, I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. And um, I wish you fruitful deliberations. So I just want to uh, thank Nick Afar for um, his call for common humanity and global mobilization and collaboration, and also highlighting the different modalities of heritage, uh, which is also covered in the white paper, the Solutions White Paper, as a uh, care of duty, a legacy, an accumulative uh, human wisdom or a species archive, as he put it, that inspires identities uh, for the positive or not. Um, uh, just to quickly ask Josh, do you have uh, any follow on thoughts from that or shall I go um, to no, I'm, I'm just okay. interested in okay, just checking before. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so just I just wanted to 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 say before we go into the questions, uh, so much of what the solutions paper offers um, is recognizing that need to consider an encompassing view of heritage that draws from both the fields of uh, heritage studies and heritage management, uh, but it also that potential solutions are formed by collective action, but, um, and that every adaptive pathway uh, con contains path dependencies and an inherent trade-off, uh, and that solutions um, also raise uh, key questions about ethics, intellectual property, and in terms of engagement. So, uh, you know, that is at the foreground of, um, of what climate justice is as well. So um, if there are any questions, please do put your hands up. Uh, I don't see any hands. So in the meantime, I, I have a question for Joshua. Um, if, if solutions are uh, rooted in prioritizing certain systems of knowledge and expertise over others, uh, how do we start to imagine those viable solutions that Nick talks about and what can we do as uh, culture and heritage uh, experts, practitioners, thinkers to help think and open um, uh, creative ways of, uh, of, supporting, of um, supporting inclusive futures, creative and uh, inclusive futures. Quite a great, oh, and big, a great and big question. <laughs> but um, I think there's many ways I think thinking about who's in the room when you're having these conversations, um, not to make any sort of um, assumptions about who's in the room now, but I, I feel like, the, the, you know, there may be people that could inform the question that you're, you're asking from their own experience um, in struggling from a, you know, a indigenous perspective, indigenous experience or like, that might be able to, you know, speak their experience to bring that into the space and have those conversations. And I think um, that's been something that has that has been more there. You know, the IPCC report, something that we talk about that 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 has come more to the fore. Um, and they see at COP COP twenty six, you see the very strong presence. But I still think that um, it's. It's a it's a it's a patchwork. It's not it's 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 not consistent across. And when you think about the spaces you enter into, who's who's in the conversation, um, and how we can open up spaces and be aware that 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 um, yeah that, that who comes into the spaces who's part of the conversation. I think that's one that's one of the one of the steps because otherwise you end up talking on behalf of others and it's it's not um, it's yeah. a repetition. That was, I suppose, one of the strengths of the white paper is that the case studies are very much in the voices of the storytellers who tell them and uh, raise their own concerns and views and perspectives. Um, so I see, uh, Dorothy, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, you talk in, your, in the white paper about the uh, effective power of heritage to mobilize people and climate action. 
and it's as, impo as an important role of the cultural heritage at the moment. Uh, we in Germany have the situation uh, that there are the climate activists, they stick themselves on paintings in museums to, uh, to raise awareness of the climate emergency. And uh, we have perhaps the, the, the role at which you think that it's important of climate of uh, heritage is another part of this uh, um, um, to, to, to take the, the cultural heritage to destroy it in, a, in, a, in some way to, uh, in, to give awareness to the climate act, uh, to, the, to climate action. Uh, what do you think about the two worlds of mobilizing um, with the power of heritage? I think, I think you put it really well there, the power of heritage. Um, I, I don't want to kind of weigh in on the rights or wrongs of that particular action, but I think it's the sort of profundity and the, the, the reaction of of interfering with the, the painting that you're talking with that it can that it can inspire um and so working with that the power of heritage um but in terms of in terms of um the one version the one version of activism and the other version of heritage sort of clashing i think that's a, a i think that's a long it's a difficult a difficult um conversation to have and um i don't i don't think i have an easy answer to that But I think that it's a, it's a, it's around the, the, the recognizing the power of heritage, recognizing that activism, spectacular activism, also has its own heritage. Um, that you know, a, a process of learning that is that is also a form of heritage. Um, and you know, one one way of thinking about it could be what what is the the aim of the one heritage? What is the possible outcome of the one heritage? In contrast to the other, but maybe that's a sim simplification of, 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 of the two. But yeah, I, don't, I, think it's a, I think it's a very interesting point that you're raising, but I don't have an easy answer to that. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, just to follow up from that, I think there is the point of um, acknowledging that there are di different, uh, different, whether it's local communities, peoples, actors, diverse actors have different understandings of heritage and part of the solutions is recognizing that we, sometimes people in positions of power have to step back so that those conversations can be heard, not only appreciated, but actually recognized um, as a valid voice. Um, yeah, sorry, can I, can I come back? Because I just made me think of, so part of my work at the moment, I'm working on the Waterland Project, which is a European-wide um, peatland restoration um, project, um, hoping to restore on a large scale peatland for carbon sequestration across Europe, but with a very conscious effort to understand peatlands as social and natural um, phenomena, um, and that those two like, are, are, are one in the same, they come together, you have to, to work with both. Um, And in the UK, there's a big problem with, we had a sort of a stakeholder meeting. Um, there's a big problem with people setting fire to, um, setting fire to peatlands, um, some by accident, but some people seemingly just doing it. People that are working to, to counteract wildfires just think people just do it just because they don't understand why. Um, and so, There's a there's a there's a question there around um, an understanding of why people take that kind of drastic action instead of dismissing it, trying to understand the social conditions that that may be behind why people are doing that, acting their protest, um, in um, rather than a sort of dismissing of it as a as much as you might not like the action they're taking. Um, trying to understand it and, and get behind it, um, uh, get behind the reasons to, to it, I think is um, as important. Yeah, the unpicking of rationale. Alexandra Cruz, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I Combining the different interventions that we had so far, I'm wondering if 
in Germany, we would need a new institute, um, institutional organization, um, which relates different actors in um, cultural heritage, management on the one hand, and climate uh, change researchers on the other hand, because on the scientific side, we have, for example, the Potsdam Institute for uh, Consequences of Climate Change. Um, we, but, uh, we, but what we are missing is an organization that brings together the different stakeholders, but on an institutional level. So that is clear, today is clear, if I want to know something about climate change from the scientific point of view, I go to the homepage of this PIC Institute in, in Potsdam. And if I want to know something about the protection rules for, for um, buildings, I go to the um, building um, management authorities and so on. But we don't have this institutional inst as an organization or um, point where we can where we can bring together the different knowledge and the different actors. And I would like and and my question is um, to to Josh Cohen and the others. Do you have in your countries similar institutions and how do they work and by whom are they organized and financed? Just do you want to have a first stab at that or um, also I know that uh, Nick and Steve, I believe, are still on the call. So if I'll, I'll um, yeah, I'll give over to Nick and Steve. I also uh, just want to uh, um, just while um, everyone is thinking about the question, if they're still here, uh, respond to that in some capacity. What I find, um, first of all, I think that uh, there is the importance as as um, as is kind of weaved throughout all of the white papers of researchers also picking up, uh, you know, picking up this conversation and influencing research agendas and fu different funding streams. But also um, I came across a research project that is, uh, that is largely based, has a, has a base in Germany called the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance. And it was really interesting because they don't at all mention or acknowledge heritage uh, studies heritage at all as a as a subject as part of their project but what they do is they speak with communities and they explore different uh, strengths and weaknesses in terms of result resilience and um, of course this is more um, uh, relevant in Germany as with the floods that recently happened a few years ago but it's and what's interesting is that uh, I think projects and collaborative projects can go a long way to um, to to sort of draw awareness um, that then gets picked up at an institutional level. So in the UK at the moment, we have a lot of different um, bodies and organizations that are uh, are um, starting to talk about how to bring in diverse you know diverse actors and and acknowledge uh, local communities. We have the National Heritage Research Fund um, Lottery Fund. Sorry that. Uh, that is very much about providing access to local communities to start consider things like sustainability and, and climate action. Um, I was recently part of a project that did exactly that. So there, so I think in sometimes, yes, it's difficult to change or create institutions, but we could also start from bottom up and start creating those sort of valuable projects that can work across disciplines and across thinking. And I would I would also add that uh, almost every, I think it was touched on by Nick's presentation, um, sorry, Nick Simpson's uh, presentation where uh, with vulnerability that there's so much um, social sciences that are a part of vulnerability. And, and there's so many projects out there that now address resilience, vulnerability, risk, and so on. And, and and in that space, there's so much that heritage can contribute, I think, too. But uh, I see Nick Simpson has his hand up, so I'll stop there. 
Uh, thanks, Hannah. Um, yeah, so just briefly to respond to Alexandra, it's it's a fantastic question. I think it hits the nub of how substantive can this research agenda and resulting practice go forward? Uh, because from my experience in the IPCC, there is a severe dichotomy between climate change research and heritage research. And that is why we emphasize the need for inter and transdisciplinary research that will overcome that barrier. Unfortunately, at the moment, most research funding is very much siloed uh, in heritage or climate change spaces. And so any progress towards institutional research uh, or large funding calls that, that demand an integrative approach um, would be great. Uh, it, we, we are past the days of when climate scientists did their thing and social scientists, heritage scientists did their thing, anthropologists did their thing. To answer the questions of climate change, we have to be integrative in our approach, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the research modality needs to accommodate that in response. I will, I will say that quite a lot of um, research, research funding calls in the UK do have an element that talk, if they're looking at climate change that do talk about interdisciplinarity, how do you incorporate, you know, they talk about impacts or they talk about public engagement of those kind of things. I think the challenge comes is when the projects are actually enacted um, and, and, and the kind of reality of there's one thing in putting it into your proposal and have an idea that you'll have a certain amount of stakeholder meetings and you'll, you'll tick that off and you'll, but, but it's the, the, I think the challenge still remains in the, the actual practical doing of the project because, because people that are working, for example, in conservation often will want to get on with the, con with their conservation and, 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 and understandably so. And there's, there's difficult conversations to happen there. Um, so I think that I do see it, and Hannah, maybe you can comment on that. I do see it, that, that there's an attempt in, in funding streams in the UK to, to ask for that interdisciplinarity, sometimes transdisciplinarity, but, it, but there's, still a, there's, a real, there's real work still to be done in, in the, in the um, application of that in practice. Yeah, absolutely. I think by nature, heritage is very interdisciplinary anyway. But you're right, uh, in lots of projects, what ends up happening when you bring other people on board is uh, when, when you get into the fieldwork or what it is, whatever it is, there's the, okay, you, you're, you know, you're, the, um, you're the climate scientist, you do this, you're the heritage person, you do this. And there's not really that knowledge exchange or a kind of a porous attitude to understand within the unit uh, what each discipline does, which I, where I think could really, really be helpful. Um, I see uh, that Alexandra has furthered um, with the question of just examples from other countries um, for such an interdisciplinary high level organization. So if anyone has that, um, you can pop it in. Does anyone have any other thoughts, questions or comments? I see Costanze. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to touch on uh, one aspect, the aspect of nature-based solutions, because that's also a point that was highlighted in the in the papers. And I just wanted to um, get the information how far this aspect is already been considered uh, in national strategies, the importance of natural heritage, cultural heritage plays when it comes to be carbon sink aspects. So that would be something that uh, would be interesting to know uh, how far you touched on that and what you came out from experiences. Um, Nature-based solutions um, as discussed in the paper or are you asking about the UK context? 
Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, the experiences because uh, you also did some research on that and that would be interesting to know um, if there's like a, a difference, for example, other countries that uh, recognize um, cultural heritage, natural heritage, for example, as carbon sinks. And if this is more included already in policy strategies, for example, so uh, I just wanted to know how far, um, especially natural heritage, is already recognized and the role it plays for uh, nature-based solutions in terms of carbon sinks. That would be yeah. interesting I to know. I, was, I would say, um, sorry, in, in, in my experience of working with it, um, that there's quite a, a large recognition in policy um, when they, and especially uh, flood management, natural flood management, because um, there's quite a lot of evidence for that. Um, and uh, there's, there's, in the literature, the, there's a still attention though around, there's a, an interest in funding capital, but sort of capital funding, so putting in the money to put in schemes, but less, less money for the monitoring their support for the so that and and that opens a question around how to involve um local communities um in that process because there's the the often when i talk to people that work in flood risk management for example they'll they'll say um where's the evidence the, the evidence base for the longer term sort of benefits of things like uh, natural flood management so there's it's definitely in in policy in the UK at least, um, but again, there's the, the the difficulties of the application. Yeah, I just I also want to follow from that. From um, in the UK, for example, there are of course we have different uh, natural England, historic England, uh, and which are advisory bodies um, to the UK government. Then we have the departments for. Um, uh, culture, media and sport, and then DEFRA, which is more environment based. So there's already, uh, which was touched on in, in the solution paper, but those path dependencies of, uh, of organizations and institutions or groups that are already set in their roles and accountability. But that said, there are increasing conversations that are being had within groups that, um, that talk about, of course, nature based solutions, uh, biodiversity net gain and um, particular ways of understanding how we can how we can use uh, you know the natural resources and services as part of uh, climate resilience and responding to climate change um, and there are just and there are conversations that happen between teams so uh, these groups of people despite what their role and mission statement might say, they are um, very aware that within the you know natural natural environment and uh, and natural heritage, that a large component of that is um, cultural in the sense of how we manage uh, sea and land and um, and different uh, kind of impacts that human activity have had on these environments for a very long time. So. For example, peatlands was mentioned by Joshua. Those are, uh, you know, naturally there's a peat strategy that's coming out in the UK, and certainly historic environment, um, is, sorry, historic England has many conversations with Defra and um, natural Ingr England on that. There's also um, uh, tree planting as a nature-based solutions that has massive implications for it, the historic environment. Those are conversations that are happening at local government as well. So we see those uh, those um, kind of groups forming together to discuss the impact that one solution has on uh, what is you know uh, conceptually seen as a different you know different component like historic environment. So those conversations are definitely happening in the UK and um, and from some of the case studies from the white paper as well, you could see the merging of those concepts. And what we tried to do in the GRA, um, the, the, the Global Research and Action Agenda, we specifically uh, used the word heritage without um, saying cultural and natural as, in the front of it as a prefix, because we are trying to begin the conversations where those two are not seen as separate. Um, so uh, there's a minute left, uh, if there's any other, um, 
And just to say, sorry, because I know that peatlands is is maybe a, a UK term, but peatlands is um, wetlands, uh, part of wetlands. So they're like swamps and um, and those kind of uh, uh, those kind of landscapes, which are used in um, for agriculture. It's very fertile and is used for water purity. Is very rich in ecosystems and so on. So I'll write. I'll write that word down and share the strategy with you all. Uh, it's time for break time unless there is a last uh, question, but if not, I would really like to thank uh, both Nick and Joshua for being here uh, with us today. Thank you so much, Joshua, for your feedback. And um, thank you. we have, uh, is it a, uh, a lunch break, in, in fact, up to uh, for an hour. So I will see you at uh, 1.45 with Dan Orlov joining from New York. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, so for the last presentation, we have Professor Ben Orlov, uh, professor in the School um, of International and Public Affairs and uh, in the Climate School of Columbia University in New York. And he's joining us from New York bright and early today. So thank you. Uh, Ben's an anthropologist by background and lead author of uh, two IPCC reports. And um, and so we hand over to you. I know. Um, will you be sharing your own slides, Ben? You're on mute. Uh, I will be sharing my slides, and in fact, I'm doing that right now. And I have to say, take a look. Uh, this actually is in Manhattan. Just by the way, didn't intend to have this up here. It's just a nice little spot in our wonderful city here. But let's move to uh, the slides. So um, anyway, delighted to be here. Thanks so much for this invitation and uh, really appreciate this possibility of presenting the white papers out of, in, uh, not in their original order, which allows me, uh, allowed me to sleep a little bit later and to hopefully be fresher to speak with you. You can see this was the first of the white papers looking at diverse knowledge systems. So that kind of, it, I think, gives a kind of background to some of the other questions of heritage and solutions, looking at tangible, intangible uh, cultural heritage and very much in the context of climate change. So I'll present to you um, just these sections, let you know who's on the author team, give a bit, bit on our orienting questions and the scoping document to see how we developed. And then we'll uh, spend most of the time with the final section of the key findings. So you can see here the uh, our 12 co-authors, uh, um, uh, Pasan Sherpa, who uh, in, himself uh, of Sherpa ethnicity from Nepal, were the, have been the two co-leads, the indigenous and the non-indigenous co-leads, and have a mix of people from different continents, from different fields. want to emphasize the strong <clears throat> indigenous presence that in addition to uh, Pasan Sherpa, there's uh, Willie Alangi, from the Philippines, who's Cordilleran background from the island of Luzon, Melissa Nelson, who's an Anishinaabe uh, from North, from Minnesota, North Central uh, U.S., Jennifer Rubis, who is Dayak from Malaysia, and Gideon Sanago, a Maasai from Tanzania. So widely representing and researchers from a variety of countries, uh, including Africa and Latin America, um, as well as the US and Europe. So really a very diverse group of people and uh, had a, we'll say a very active uh, process, many meetings, lots of discussions. So we received orienting questions, um, looking at this systemic connections of culture and heritage and climate change. And uh, as I'm sure you've been discussing these words, culture and heritage themselves have a a rich culture and a long heritage. They uh, are part of systems of meanings. They have a significant legacy. And so many areas of overlap and complementarity and also some efforts to bring them into full alignment because they had developed in some ways in parallel, but with some differences. So we're looking at the just so many forms of culture and heritage to look at and looking at knowledge systems as they connect with those 
seen them very much in the context of climate research, climate responses. And so looking to put these together. Um, and so I have mentioned here both the, bringing these two terms, tangible and intangible aspects were words that came forward extensively in our discussions. Uh, I'll say that as an anthropologist, I'm well aware of material culture and material objects and certainly have training in archaeology, as many anthropologists do, so know quite a bit about sites, but really focusing on what's tangible and intangible <clears throat> and how they connect and really how they're managed, what institutions have worked with them, uh, quite a complex question, and then trying also to see how they uh, can move forward to address climate change. And we have this word diverse knowledge, knowledge systems. We spent a lot of time working on vocabulary, wanting to make sure that we're using words that are appropriate to all of us. And uh, one of the things I learned extensively from, the, from our indigenous colleagues is their strong sensitivity to the words that describe cultures. They ha have often felt themselves to be the objects of knowledge production rather than the subjects of knowledge production. They're described more than describing. And I mentioned this because the word, the phrase diverse knowledge systems was one that we landed on as conveying our meanings better than plural knowledge systems. Uh, the diverse really emphasizes not merely that there are a number of knowledge systems, but that they're quite distinct one from another. Uh, that, and I think that, that appreciation for differences is what underlies the choice of diverse rather than plural knowledge systems. I'm sure you've had a lot of attention to wording. You want to point out the diversity within each of the knowledge systems as well as the differences. There can be times where people say science. There's just one form of scientific knowledge, indigenous knowledge. It's everywhere the same. We really see quite a bit of diversity within them. We also had two words here that were uh, became quite important integration of diverse knowledge systems, which we were directed to uh, to discuss. We ended up landing more on collaboration. Integration can sort of seem a mixing, a hybridity, a fusion, a creation of something new, which though it can combine elements from other knowledge systems, can also erase the differences. You just sort of get all mixed up into a uh, sort of a uh, new melange. And so we really want to see the knowledge systems, the diverse knowledge systems is retaining their integrity and yet finding many ways to collaborate. Uh, so we, um, and so we were really interested in this reconsideration. Um, I'm realizing I might want to pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, we do want to, we ourselves recognize that climate change has a history. This is an important point for us. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of the Anthropocene as kind of a new era, but uh, climate change itself has a history and there are different views of these histories. And so one of the things that we brought forward were indigenous histories and local histories, different ways that groups have of understanding and portraying their past and acting on the basis of that. So our scoping questions, uh, we're looking at um, the, looking at these diverse knowledge systems at the time of crisis, seeing collaborations that provide basis for climate action. We review the literature, found some gaps. We landed on case studies rather than doing a large survey of many examples of knowledge systems. Our white paper has eight detailed case studies that present some of the context, and I think some of the specificity of the forms of collaboration. We're not quick to generalize. We think that these each have uh, specific histories, uh, particular features. We certainly mention a large number of other examples, so have an extensive bibliography, but we found that looking systematically at the eight case studies was very useful for our sort of initial white paper, which itself is of course not a full assessment. So we, even thinking about knowledge, we found that there are two key terms that we use, knowledge systems. 
um, and ways of knowing. The knowledge systems kind of has more to do with kind of thought and perhaps practice uh, and, and sort of sees knowledge as kind of already codified the ways of ways of knowing talks more about knowledge as process as continually engaging with the world with communities and being uh, renewed. Uh, we have this question here of different uh, terminologies landed on a very widely used definition of knowledge systems, these sets of interacting agents, practices, and institutions that organize the production, transfer, and use of knowledge. So this really brings forward the idea that knowledge exists in communities. That's true of scientific knowledge as well as local indigenous knowledge and how it doesn't just sit there. Knowledge is kind of facts and data in people's minds, but that it's transferred between people and engaged in practice. We like that definition. So we have some general points here. Um, again, I'm conscious that I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. So I'll point to these, uh, that these are features that all the knowledge systems share, indigenous knowledge, scientific knowledge, um, their uh, local knowledge as well. <clears throat> Could have mentioned if there are any important, if there are clarifying questions, could possibly put them in the chat or uh, Hannah could mention them to me. Otherwise we can say from towards the end. We want to see knowledge systems as distinct and really in a way seeking to preserve their autonomy. Scientists really view science as a world of knowledge. That's true of indigenous people. The local knowledge that you might find in uh, an informal settlement in an African city or uh, among a group of craft workers in Southeast Asia, they also preserve their knowledge. Though these knowledge systems have long histories, uh, long continuous histories, our third point is that, that we want to emphasize is that they're dynamic and resilient. So many people have argued that indigenous knowledge was perhaps good in its time, but it described a static world uh, that predates um, climate change. And once the environment starts changing, uh, indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems are destined just to quickly become outdated and then disappear. And we, our case studies show again and again how the indigenous knowledge systems provide a system of monitoring the world, of observing it, of detecting and accounting for change, uh, whether those are uh, indigenous peasants in the Andes who are moving crops to new zones and developing new forms of cultivation or uh, new ways of adapting traditional building techniques in the Philippines to deal with uh, more extensive typhoons. These knowledge systems are highly dynamic. Spent a lot of time talking about the uh, material and mental components that kind of correspond to tangible and intangible culture, though not uh, completely precisely. Um, and we really emphasize the activity that's present in knowledge systems, ways of being in the world, uh, many forms of engagement, relating and caring. And caring is, was actually an important word for us, the thought that in many indigenous, well, many knowledge systems, generally there's that sense of uh, um, the, the sense that there's a relationship that people have with uh, the natural world. And it's not just out there as a bunch of resources to provide livelihood. Uh, I, perhaps the, the German word Umweltschutz conveys some of the idea that there's a responsibility as well as just a rationality or a functionality in the caring for the environment. So we note a lot of new attention to local, in the three forms indigenous knowledge is getting uh, more attention, though indigenous participation and the writing about indigenous knowledge uh, is uh, really mo more recent. People feel that scientific knowledge is sort of, we know what it is, that although new research on science as a phenomenon is growing. And uh, there is um, growing attention to local knowledge though that's sometimes just left over is that everybody else. Um, the biodiversity world conservation broadly has looked much more at indigenous and local knowledge than the climate world, though that's changing. 
Indigenous uh, organizations themselves are becoming very active in this work. And moving here to say that we looked, uh, developed some interesting case studies to show the interaction of tangible and intangible uh, heritage serving adaptation. Uh, thinking of Fiji, where uh, there have been remarkable cases of lo locally organized relocating villages away from coastal zones that are eroding, having salt water penetrating the aquifers. We note uh, the whole role of the tangible culture. The meeting houses are the places where the discussions take place and in, uh, contained within the architecture of the meeting houses are processes for the Talanoa for a form of dialogue. So you have the architecture supporting uh, the intangible culture of discussion that allowed a whole village process of rethinking. And I'd mentioned the irrigated terraces that, that are being uh, maintained and extended in areas, both for protection against landslides and for managing irrigation water with um, rising temperatures, changing precipitation. So the irrigated terraces are tangible heritage, but there's intangible systems of management. Similar cases in uh, informal ur urban settlements. Uh, this was an important cases in our study. Uh, so we want to support these um, support collaborations. Uh, I've mentioned collaboration rather than integration. A uh, lot of sensitivity to not have um, sort of indigenous and local knowledge somehow swept up in a new system. There's certainly the fear that science would marginalize them. And we wanna recognize uh, that the histories are difficult, that you can't just propose, let's form a collaboration, let's have a couple of meetings where people share ideas and we move forward. There are long histories of exclusion, um, efforts to, uh, to erase national languages to impose, erase indigenous languages and replace them with national languages, whole system of pedagogy that uh, treats, has often devalued uh, indigenous knowledge and local knowledge or made it sort of a little folklore spectacle that comes out twice a year and then we return to a modern world that's based on science. So we're, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about the Respect and recognition were two words that we came to land on that uh, to have ways to make sure that the different knowledge systems acknowledge each other. There's a whole series of specific mechanisms. Free prior and informed consent is the active agreement of indigenous and local communities to take part in collaborative projects. A customary law, the is also quite important. We've seen that in many cases, if we're drawing on uh, indigenous or local knowledge, uh, heritage, whether tangible, intangible. I want to recognize that many communities already have ways of making decisions of how to use land, how to use water, how to access. Uh, if you're managing, if managing a forest uh, jointly with an indigenous community, means not merely that you recognize that the indigenous people know the names of the trees, they may have certain forms of management that can be sustainable, but that their forms of management lead them to have um, village authorities that govern the, uh, the forests. And we see many barriers to collaboration. Um, so, uh, a number of lessons from the case studies. I'll perhaps turn to those when I uh, go ahead talking about, uh, you, can, I, you can see some of the flavor here. Wanted to mention this because Antarctic exploration seems like a really powerful case because you imagine that the history of Antarctica began really only 200 years ago when your European explorers landed. So we have, first of all, the documented early visits from the Maori. These are the Polynesian peoples of New Zealand who, uh, if they're seafarers who could get from Hawaii to New Zealand, it's not so hard for them to travel further south and report on these lands that are covered in snow and ice. And want to mention that the first overwintering 
expedition in Antarctica was uh, run by Norwegians and they had Sami. You may know them also by the name of Laps or Laplanders. So it was the Sami dog handlers who came along with the Norwegians and were really quite comfortable managing dog teams in snow-covered landscapes. And the coastal winters in Antarctica are not that much more severe than the ones in northern Norway. They knew what to do. And so that was the successful expeditions that really contrasted with some of the difficulties that the British faced who were less willing to use indigenous technologies, trying to bring uh, horses rather than dogs to these landscapes, and also not collaborating with indigenous people. So it's a pretty remarkable case. Had some coordinating questions with the other two white papers that you've heard about. And so I think that's part of what made our conference so successful is looking at these areas of overlap. We were able to comment on each other's drafts. We developed a worked to align our vocabularies and also set up our references, which kind of makes things more orderly. So some time for our key uh, points here. These are numbered and so I'll go through these. Uh, our review of the literature shows the importance of diverse and plural knowledge systems. And these, this discussion has focused primarily on these three categories, as I've mentioned, indigenous local scientific knowledge. And we see diversity within those. Indigenous knowledge systems is the one that have received the most extensive recognition in assessment reports, um, certainly international agencies in IPCC and the biodiversity groups, many, um, many other bodies. There's growing literature on local knowledge, not as extensive. We have here the tangible and intangible elements. Uh, and I think you're, we really wish to underscore that. This is in our executive summary, not a surprise to you. Uh, we have um, the variety of intangible elements includes things that I think are widely recognized as connecting with knowledge, concepts and beliefs, but we include the values, the worldviews, the spirituality. These are things we take seriously. Um, and so it, the, and these lead to affiliations with the fields of culture and heritage, though those are sometimes represented by different organizations. So we have here um, tried to have a few tables, and these tables may be of interest to you. We have here, we looked at um, sort of the world of heritage and the world of knowledge systems. And these here are our eight case studies, Fiji, uh, South American forests, uh, local water systems in Spain, indigenous fire in the Bolivian lowlands, forests in Nepal, the terraces in the Philippines, informal urban settlements in West Africa, really interesting case on urban Native Americans in the Southwest United States in cities that go back actually to the early Spanish colonization in Arizona and California. So we see various types of tangible heritage monuments building. And I can't believe we have site misspelled here. Um, landscapes, movable heritage, sort of objects that can move around, intangible heritage. These I think are familiar UNESCO categories. Knowledge systems, are, we divided into thought and action. So we're seeing that many are cases, many more cells that are checked than are not checked. Most of our cases, all our cases have multiple elements in these different components of heritage and knowledge system. Though they're not identical systems, they're both richly represented. We point out the importance of that these knowledge systems themselves and their practitioners, their holders, see the urgency of dealing with climate change, though they see different diagnoses of causes and different pathways to be taken. Really striking how for the indigenous uh, participants, climate change is simply yet another element in a centuries long history, often of dispossession from their lands, uh, being relocated, um, other other sorts of environmental challenges as well as other kinds of challenges 
and in the local knowledge systems to whether the traditional irrigation systems in Spain or the informal urban settlements in West Africa, they too see many other pressures, not just climate change. So climate change itself is framed a bit differently. Uh, we have here, um, this is another one of our figures looking tables, looking at interactions of indigenous or local peoples and communities with scientific knowledge. And these range from generally positive to generally negative. Uh, the, in the case of Bolivia, the kind of government people, the government agencies managing lowland forests are really in opposition to the local communities and it's tense, but there are other cases where the alignment is very positive, whether in Fiji or in Nepal, others are mixed. We notice the scale of interactions from local to regional to national. So what are the authorities and the governance? We look at the phases of interactions. Do the different knowledge systems interact only at one component of a process or all the components, or is it ongoing beyond the individual projects? And where it's most positive in Fiji and Nepal is also where you have the most extensive ongoing interactions. And we see a variety of governance and me uh, governance mechanisms and safeguards here. So we see that many people speak for this collaboration. Like there are many international bodies that'll say, let's uh, promote collaboration of different knowledge systems that'll help us be more effective in climate uh, climate action. And we came up with two key dimensions to, su to, to support these collaborations. One is fullness and the sense of completeness of not being just a few components, but a more s systemic or systematic engagement. That's kind of the ep epistemic dimension, looking at all elements of knowledge. The other is the justice dimension, which looks at the ethics and the politics. And this justice is certainly supported by mutual recognition and by respect. Um, and one of the things that we're really emphasizing, I'll hope to, let me say, I hope to wrap up in the next few minutes to allow time for questions, is that we have these specific mechanisms to protect different knowledge systems. Recognition and respect are certainly important goals. Uh, they're, uh, they're fundamental as kind of preconditions, but just sort of saying, oh yes, we will acknowledge each knowledge system will recognize the other is not the same as saying we have particular steps we can take to assure that this comes forward. And we've mentioned here three prior informed consent so that the projects, uh, when, they when projects come forward, they're really presented thoroughly so that communities can decide whether to accept them or not to accept them. There uh, have mentioned um, intellectual property rights for all knowledge systems, complex question. There are international bodies that govern intellectual property rights. They're much more suited, unsurprisingly, to a Western scientific system of patents, of recognizing the first author to publish. Can indig how do indigenous communities, how do local, communi local communities established intellectual property rights still ongoing. Um, so we're quite attuned to these mechanisms. And we have here, uh, again, looking at our cases, we look to see, is the collaboration full? Does it include um, obser certainly observations? Everyone understands that knowledge systems kind of describe the world and the practices, the ways that those are put into use, the values and the ethics, which overlap in some ways, kind of also underpin the fullness of collaboration, that they understand the, the world views. And then whether the collaboration is just, we came up with four criteria as well, looking for recognition and respect. We went through the case studies and came up with some criteria to decide how we can kind of, how we can declare these present or absent. We look to see whether the engagement was sustained, whether it went up for on for over five years or not. And then we look to see are, were there specific mechanisms like full prior and informed consent or indigenous property rights. So this is a little mechanistic. This is kind of a quantification of something that's in reality more qualitative. 
but we thought it was useful to show uh, the range of, it, it, it serves for a white paper to move towards a way of categorizing different cases. And we certainly see that the, these two dimensions, if you bridge the fullness and justice to see the strong support of collaboration, the scores range very widely from the a couple of low ones at two to the highest ones of seven and eight. Um, and it's interesting to see that the Fiji and um, uh, the Fijian village relocation of the forest governance in Nepal rank high. And the urban Native American cases in the U.S. also rank high because of the, I think, the strong pressure from the long sustained activism of Native American communities and also some of the attention to multiculturalism in the U.S. So we're going here to um, recognizing that there are a um, variety of forms of successful collaborations. Those three cases are very different, surely, in Fiji, Nepal, and, the, and uh, San Francisco and Phoenix here in the United States, very different. So one of the things that most important things that we find is the need for the length of collaboration, that these don't just spring up quickly. It's not just uh, including uh, including diverse knowledge systems, it, it, not just an ingredient you can drop into a project proposal, have it run for a few years and you're done. You really need to develop and sustain the relationships. And uh, COP26 last year, the meeting of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change brought forward more recognition of indigenous peoples and it's speaking more about collaboration, uh, certainly hope that that'll be continued uh, this year in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt and then next year with the global stock take in the United Arab Emirates. So I have complete, I have, I have spoken for one more minute than I intended. Um, and which for me is really quite exceptional. And I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. Happy to take questions. Ahana, however, whatever your guidance is, I already see a hand up from Dorotea. Uh, that That is a clap for you, a virtual clap. Thank you so, so much, uh, uh, Ben. And also thanks for raising the point that um, all three of these papers are actually interconnected because that was something that I actually um, overlooked saying. And um, and yeah, a fantastic, a fantastic presentation. I think uh, just before, um, while we're waiting on hands to come up, so how we're doing this, Ben, because I know you just joined is uh, hands that come and then it's the floor goes to them. So I see a uh, Birte, if uh, you're welcome to unmute and ask a question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your really inspiring talk. And um, I was wondering, because in the former discussion we had, the, it was said that there's the need of an institution, an overframe an institution, or the need for a transdisciplinary work. And I was wondering, in concern of your point of collaboration rather than integration, how would you... Um, evaluate the need for such an overframing or framing institution rather than strengthening our networking systems? So uh, and that's a very broad question and people love to imagine that they somehow uh, were uh, 18th century emperors who just had ideas and they then went into practice. Uh, certainly, we have existing institutions that bring a broad, broad legacy and we wish to move forward with them, we wish to build upon them. I guess I, 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 you were at, let me ask to clarify, were you asking, do we need an institution or do we need a network? If that was kind of your question. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily an opposition. That mm -hmm. is, I think we could, you could convene meetings that would be points of encounter, and those could be regular, which would promote a kind of dialogue. And so those would have some process that would be designed, it just wouldn't, but it would also allow groups to come together and to develop. So the institution itself would be, I'm thinking might be something that would develop from a series of meetings rather than being created all at once with all its health set forward. 
uh, I also think we face uh, so, and that's important because of the huge uh, need for this task, uh, the wide range of groups that are coming together and also how rapidly changing the uh, panorama is. So I think we can't, uh, it, I can imagine initiatives, I could imagine new meetings and new frameworks, but I'm not sure that I would translate that to an institution that had a governing body that had certain members which might leave some people excluded. I think you'd want to think also a variety of forms of participation. You might, while I'm thinking about this, uh, it occurs to me that you, uh, when you think of organizations and institutions, you often think of membership, but I think it would be important to uh, at least address the question of having many uh, kind of observer organizations that, that would also be invited to partic participate. If that, anyway, anyway, good question and thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I would, I, I suppose I would like, I would like to make a comment while people are thinking. So a lot of what the um, uh, Knowledge Systems White Paper promotes is exactly what you were saying, Ben, that co-production and collaboration rather than integration. And from your presentation, it's it's clear that adaptation planning and implementation at all levels of governance uh, at, are um, are contingent on those sort of knowledge system, societal values, objectives, worldviews, and so on. And uh, and that we need to recognize these sort of diverse, as you put it, interests and social cultural contexts and so on. So this is kind of following from Bertis. So. And it's it's not do we need a network or an institution, but institutions exist at the moment. And uh, what what would you say are uh, is needed to recognize different forms of evidence and values uh, in our understanding of climate change? Do those existing frameworks or organizations and bodies need to? suddenly like make a working group or bring more people to the table or do they need to have reflexive thinking of how they approach their own values what is the first step would you suggest so uh kind of um you asked me a question for a first step and i'm not sure that and, and then you were asking me do they need the either or and when you're asking the either, either or is saying thanks for that question i can say all of it but then you asked me for the first step i i want to suggests that this is not, it, this may, uh, the white paper tends to a generality, it makes things seem kind of abstract perhaps, and that we're calling for hugely different ways of doing things. And I, to give just a couple of concrete examples, that's why we liked our case studies, wildfire is such a huge issue uh, in Europe, as well as in longer problem here in the United States, Australia, around the world. Indigenous fire management is quite different. There's a history of controlled burns. And the way, and though it can be a challenge to bring that back in after uh, a century or more of fire suppression, there certainly are ways to do that. And we're seeing that around the world, certainly in California, Canada, and the United States, where indigenous consultants join with fire agencies, form task forces, review, uh, come up with plans, and have found ways to reduce fire risk, thinking of Pakistan, city uh, to have a local knowledge case, country that we think of now for the floods, and we are hearing of, of just improvisations of people in flooded villages because of the lack of any government support. But when I think the Pakistan example I'll give for climate change is heat waves, where the responses to heat waves come partly from the meteorological agencies that can anticipate the heat waves can give a couple of weeks of warning, but just how much dense knowledge there is in cities that have large informal settlements about transport, about shade, about access to drinking water, so that there can be spontaneous solutions of reorganizing the workday to have an earlier start, a longer afternoon break, and that does entail reorganizing these uh, transportation systems, which are often 
informal, lightly regulated vans that just carry people around. So that's, it's not a mysterious process. There's just the hope that the hospitals that are receiving the people who are suffering most from the heat waves can pass their information back to the neighborhood groups that are also coming up with solutions. So I, I think um, though we can see the gap in these sorts of exercises, there are also so many of them, fisheries communities in, uh, as the oceans are warming, fish stocks are broadly migrating uh, to higher latitudes and how do local fishing communities recognize that in the areas where there are mangroves, where there are coral reefs, they often see, they also see the impacts on these ecosystems that sustain the fisheries. And here too, the forms of knowledge, they, many points of interaction. And so, uh, and, and then we say, well, we need the recognition and the respect. And so that takes some reflection. We want some mechanisms, but really dialogue. And I, uh, I was about to say goodwill, and uh, it's a scarce commodity in our world, but I think available as the magnitude of the task comes into view. We, I, we came away from this white paper very optimistic, I have to say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Constanze, I see your hand is up. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for the great presentation, actually. Um, I have one question because it refers to a question that was already addressed uh, during your work. So um, what has become clear is the need of policies and legal frameworks in order to guarantee this kind of cooperation you mentioned and to support the integration of uh, these different knowledge systems and climate actions. So my question would be, um, did you find any country where these kind of policies or frameworks are already implemented in a very good way um, that could be seen as, I don't know, like a, a, an advantage or a, like a best practice example, um, something we from Germany, for example, can even look at. That would be something that is interesting for me because I say uh, for the discussion we are having now, um, so I can I, I hear that, and I'm trying to think of what would be cases that would be most relevant for Germany. So when you were thinking of countries, I was again going to emphasize the variety of cases we found. Canada Canada is often cited as a country that's taken huge steps to recognize indigenous knowledge, but who would have thought that Nepal and Fiji would have a strong recognition of customary law? and respect for custom, customary institutions. Uh, I'm thinking, um, wondering whether there are, um, the case that's coming to mind, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's in my mind, so I'll mention it, uh, that's closer to Germany is the Netherlands, where I think the water planning is often quite consultative and is not just a national water boards saying, well, we have our forecasts for sea level rise and we have our forecasts for flow in the Rhine River, so we need nothing more. But I think there's also engagement with the local communities that would be very much involved in the la very specific land use planning, whether for coastal defenses or for reconfiguring the uh, watersheds. So, so I think, um, when you ask that question about best practices, um, it's a very popular phrase. I think I this perhaps is a diversion, but I will say that I sometimes worry that the phrase best practices leads people to think there is an answer and we can look for it and when we have it, we're done. I think the world is filled with a variety of good practices and it, there's you need a process to select among those for the ones that match your circumstances well. And that goes back to my suggestion of consultation rather than um, sort of saying, yes, there's the best practice and we're just gonna adopt what someone else is doing because it worked for them. Does, does that, I, I don't know if that's a useful answer or just sort of maybe. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you so much. Now, I was just wondering because uh, during your work uh, in the project, uh, you were looking at a broad range of case studies. So I was just wondering if there is already uh, a country that uh, could be, I don't know, mentioned as an example where good policies are already implemented, where uh, diverse knowledge sy systems um, are already considered. So, um, because I just know from the case of Germany that it's still a big issue. It's uh, a lack of consideration, I think. So, um, I was just curious. I mean, I always look at UK, of course, because I think um, they have at least a good start in this direction. So, um, yeah, I was just curious about the experiences you made. You're reminding me I've only had one cup of coffee this morning, so perhaps not everything is as fresh as it might be. <laughs> okay. The UK is widely cited in terms of coastal planning because they draw heavily on uh, local communities and the local communities have a good deal of knowledge. Uh, and some of that actually does tie in with uh, a tangible heritage to the um, various forms of coastal defenses and then observing what... Uh, the effects of coastal erosion on specific sites. Mentioning the coastal case in the UK in conjunction with the water in the Netherlands leads me to also wonder, or to having those two cases leads me to think that sometimes there are specific sectors where the co-management is advancing, much as the forest management has advanced relatively well and is beginning to advance in the US in a way that uh, for uh, water management may not be doing so well in our areas that are really being devastated by drought. So uh, rather than thinking that there's gonna be a national policy that's gonna address everything, it could be interesting to see what are um, sectors uh, where there's a beginning and then you could move, uh, could perhaps advance on that. There are places where uh, traditional irrigation has, al has also advanced, where village systems actually <coughs> leads me to think of the, uh, there's a literature on pasture and forest management in the Alps. A lot of that, uh, th there's a rich literature from Switzerland and uh, it's quite, you know, I, I don't know the specific discussions in southern Germany, but there could well be communities that have vigorous systems of managing uh, uh, managing uh, pastures, managing forests, which obviously are different from when these were largely subsistence um, farming systems, but nonetheless, those institutions retain, and that might be a place, uh, might be one area, and I would imagine that those are relatively well studied. Um, that was uh, the, uh, there is a political scientist, Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for her research on common property systems, the sort of village or community management. And, so, and, and a lot of those are uh, mountain forests and pastures. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, we've come to uh, half past, are there any other questions? I realize um, I, I'm gonna put my, you probably have this, but I'll just put my uh, email in the chat if anyone wants to reach out. We do have one more question. Um, well, not a question actually, but it's a comment, but I'll read it out anyway. Are participants aware of the work being done in Australia regarding Western science? and Indigenous Australian knowledge systems. Uh, Ben's also put his email. Thank you, Ben. And uh, Dorothy, I see your hand is up. Uh, just to say we're three minutes over, so we're cutting into yes. conversation time. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Ben, for your uh, great uh, presentation. I have a last question to Hannah. Hannah showed us uh, this morning uh, examples for uh, our German challenges, how to uh, to discuss the thing in Germany. And I will uh, ask you 
What do you think with which challenge we should start with in Germany? <laughs> Have you an idea for us? <laughs> so, um, well, um, one of the things that I think, at least what I do in from a UK perspective, uh, because I think a lot of um, uh, Constanza, what you were asking, for example, the, uh, you know, and what I was asking also about first steps, it's how to first recognize in our in our own selves how we can contribute as whether as experts, as pr um, practitioners, as people that are part of members of the public, um, what we feel that we can each bring to climate change discussions. And I think that is uh, one of the, the I, I suppose, key points that I've been trying to circulate with a couple of other uh, spearheading people in, in the UK, like Anna, Dr. Hannah Fluck, who is in Historic England and now is in, in the Nat National Trust, and, um, and other folk where it's as someone, as a practitioner um, in, in heritage, whether you're a built environment, whether you're working with local communities, landscape, archeology, span whatever it might be, what do you feel your expertise is to conversations? And I think that is really one of the starting points to find our own relevance to the conversation because I've noticed that uh, if we don't have that, and if steps are taken further, you do leave people behind in, uh, in trying to figure out how they jump on the bandwagon, because it is, it is a bandwagon in a sense where, of course, these conversations have been going on for decades and you know, for over 50 years, if not more. And uh, I find a lot of people that I speak to or online um, suddenly come out with these very basic questions of, well, what, there, there is no relevance that archaeology has, or there is no relevance that heritage studies and management has to the climate conversation. So I would say that is a first uh, step. And I, um, and again, in that, uh, how can you be proactive in your response? So just by way of example, um, I, alongside my work with um, ICMOS for the ICSM project, um, I'm working in England and as Ben mentioned with uh, coastal communities and we recently did um, finished a, a seven year co coastal community project called Citizen Coastal and Intertidal um, Zone Archaeology Network and it was literally uh, trying to um, build capacity in communities and uh, and show how archaeology and heritage can be a really strong um, Put you in a strong position to start conversations about uh, loss, losses and damages, um, about uh, managed, you know, uh, coastal realignment uh, that's happening more and more, about uh, needing to move about traditional skills and practices in historic buildings and traditional houses. Um, so many conversations, and now we're looking. Now we're looking at a hundred years of um, how communities have observed and evidenced um, change in their immediate in environment. And this is found through uh, photos, uh, postcards, um, uh, social spaces that they can no longer go, certain biodiversity, you know, uh, there's a lot of communities that look at birds and butterflies with their binoculars and they've seen, and they tick it off actually, so they have it um, literally evidenced and they've seen decline. So we're starting to do a project on that. And that's where my, that's how I'm using my expertise in terms of the climate discussion. So I think it's really, I would, I would start there before trying to start at where institutions should go. Yeah, okay. Hannah, may, may I interrupt? Uh, and thank you very much for the preparation of this meeting, for the comments, also for the introduction in this morning, which was adequate, also reflecting the situation in Germany and in German speaking countries, and also for answering now. And many thanks to Will McGear and all the speakers and presenters for the, uh, for the inputs we received. We will now discuss. I, I feel a little bit uh, urged to cut it now because we do, do not only have one hour left to talk. One of the main issues is how can it be adapted 
how can it be made productive? All these results for Germany, as you mentioned, we should find starting points and we do not yet know how to start and who will accompany us and will have the, which, uh, which shares can be uh, given by them. So it's now we have 50 minutes, I hope we have left. And I would like to thank all of you very much, uh, Ben, for the last presentation, which was very interesting. And also for those who have read the executive summary, it's always very helpful to see and to talk to the authors and to the presenters and to understand what was the meaning behind. And so we will see what is a knowledge system, for example, and how can knowledge systems be defined and how can relationships and links between knowledge systems systematically be uh, developed. So may I say goodbye for all of you who do not want to join the German speaking part, uh, the, the final or the closing part, which I have to start you know, with many thanks to you. I, I thank you very well. Das tut mir leid, den Abschied zu machen. Ich spreche kein gutes Deutsch, obwohl jetzt muss ich nach einer Klasse gehen. Uh, also, uh, zum nächsten Mal. Uh, ben, das ist hervorragend, wenn wir das wissen. <laughs> Schade, dass du nicht dabei sein kannst, aber wir werden auf deine Deutschkenntnisse, die werden wir bestimmt noch produktiv machen können, weil wir stehen erst am Anfang des Prozesses and we want to continue, of course, the whole process. And you gave now the initial statements. Uh, to das, hoffe, das hoffe ich. Ich, auch. ich darf alle also alle verabschieden und mich bei allen bedanken, die nicht mehr bei uns sind und alle herzlich begrüßen, die noch mal bei uns sind. Äh, mein Name ist Jörg Haspel und zusammen mit Frau Bösler, Konstanze Fuhrmann, Marie Baudis und anderen haben wir versucht, die Chance zu nutzen, dass dieses Gespräch zwischen Weltklimarat-Experten und Heritage-Experten, dass wir das auch für den deutschsprachigen Raum irgendwie produktiv machen können. Und da hat uns doch sehr geholfen die Vorgabe der DBU, dass man sagte, wir sind sozusagen kein weltweit operierende Stiftung. Wir denken zwar global, aber wir müssen auch lokal und national irgendwie einen Ertrag bringen. Und deshalb haben wir versucht, das so zu münzen, dass es einerseits eine Förderung möglich war für die DBU und andererseits, dass wir vielleicht auch hier ganz konkret davon profitieren können. Wir haben jetzt eine Stunde Zeit noch und haben davon schon einige Minuten äh, verloren und wollten in dieser Zeit diskutieren. Erstens im Sinne der, der White Papers, das Thema der Integration der Wissenssysteme, das ist das, was jetzt am Schluss kam. Zum Zweiten wollten wir diskutieren und das würde dann äh, Dorothee Bösel übernehmen, die Frage der Befähigung, Ermächtigung der Kulturakteure, der Zusammenarbeit. Zum Dritten die Frage der Förderung und der Kooperation in Forschung und Politik, was Konstanze Fuhrmann übernehmen würde. Und hätten am Schluss dann nochmal die, äh, die Förderstrategien und Förderprogramme, was muss gemacht werden, um Capacities oder Resources zu mobilisieren für dieses Thema. Das sind die vier Hauptthemen und dann hätten wir zwei am Schluss, die wir gerne noch ansprechen wollen, weil wir gesagt haben, es ist eigentlich eine einmalige Chance, so viele interessierte Kolleginnen und Kollegen wenigstens an einem Bildschirm zusammen zu haben, nämlich, dass wir dann auch noch mal besprechen, die Idee oder das Vorhaben eines Positionspapiers. Das sind wir gegenüber ICOMOS International Paris als ICOMOS Deutschland eingegangen und zum Zweiten über weitere mögliche Aktivitäten, weil wir vermeiden wollen, dass das wie ein Strohfeuer sozusagen das Ende einer Debatte ist, sondern wir verstehen es vielmehr als den Auftakt einer Debatte, die ermöglicht wurde durch den Input, den wir heute erfahren haben. Eingangs würde mich eins noch interessieren, einfach um das besser verorten zu können, weil ich hier viele schwarze Kacheln sehe mit wunderbaren Namen, von denen ich manche auch reidentifizieren kann, aber bei anderen auch etwas ratlos bin. Ist überhaupt jemand hier in, in diesem virtuellen Raum dabei, guten Tag, guten Tag, guten Tag, es wird immer mehr, sehr schön, ähm, der, der nicht für, äh, aus der Bundesrepublik stammt oder für die Bundesrepublik hier ist oder in Deutschland tätig ist. Also sind Kolleginnen aus der Schweiz, aus Österreich, aus Luxemburg, aus Südtirol, aus, aus Belgien, die wir mit eingeladen haben, überhaupt hier jetzt versammelt? Äh, Sehe ich das richtig? Alexandra Treu ist 
Wollen Sie das uns verraten, woher Sie sind? Ich bin gewissermaßen mit zwei Hüten hier. Also Hochschule Coburg und Eurak in Bozen, Südtirol. Ah ja, wunderbar. Vielen, vielen Dank dafür. Aber das heißt, wir, wir sind dann noch ziemlich deutsch äh, zentriert, so wie es, ist, äh, wie es ist aussieht. Äh, und müssen dann noch mal gucken, ob man das wenigstens erweitern kann. Das war unser Interesse. Wenn Sie, wenn Sie erlauben, würde ich noch mal zu der Integration der Wissenssysteme, das ist ja das, was zuletzt äh, Ben Orloff vorgestellt hatte, noch mal ähm, einsteigen. Und wir hatten in der Vorbereitung und auch in der Nachbereitung in, diesem, in dieser kleinen Gruppe ähm, immer einen Definitionsbedarf. Ich habe das angedeutet. Was sind hier äh, in diesem Raum, was sind die Kenntnisse indigenous äh, Kenntnisse unter Indigenous People ähm, und was, was ist tra Traditional Knowledge? Also welche, welche Wissenssysteme könnten oder müssten sehr viel stärker berücksichtigt und aktiviert werden eigentlich für Denkmalschutz und Denkmalpflege? Das ist das eine, wo ich um Stellungnahmen oder Statements dankbar wäre. Und das zweite überhaupt die Frage, ähm, wir sind ja mutmaßlich hier, mehrheitlich sozusagen aus dem Bereich Denkmalschutz und Denkmalpflege. Aber es gibt ja, der Ansatz dieser, dieser Gespräche ist ja sozusagen einen erweiterten Kulturbegriff, der auch andere Erbschaften bis hin zu den Immateriellen und das Naturerbe mit in, äh, einbezieht. Ähm, wie, wie sehen Sie, das ist das sozusagen ein, ein wichtiges ähm, Anliegen und müssten wir mal über weitere Schritte nachdenken, müsste das möglicherweise sogar am Anfang stehen und wer könnte da als Partner in Frage kommen? Gibt es da schon Rückmeldungen über die Frage, was, was machen wir mit dem Traditional Knowledge oder mit den Indigenous People und dem Indigenous Knowledge? Frau Wendland, sehe ich. Ja, ähm, habe ich auch während des Zuhörens überlegt und dachte, wir haben sicherlich viel solches Wissen nicht mehr, oder das Wissen oft nicht mehr bei den Menschen, aber wir haben es ja gerade in den letzten Jahrzehnten doch wieder gezielt hervorgeholt durch Bauforschung zum Beispiel. Also wenn ich, und zum Teil auch durch Archäologie, wenn ich beispielsweise an das ganze Thema Stampflehmbauten denke, wo jetzt auch in Halle ja dieses Golem-Projekt ähm, arbeitet, wo es ja tatsächlich darum geht, ähm, altes Wissen über die Herstellung, Wartung und ähm, vielleicht auch sogar Reparatur von, von Stampflehmbauten oder eben auch die neue Herstellung ähm, wieder zu aktivieren. Ähm, sind da Archäologen, Bauforscher und ja, sagen wir mal, die, die letzten Eigentümer von solchen Gebäuden ähm, dabei. Das könnte tatsächlich bei uns so eine, eine Strecke sein. Und ich würde auch an bestimmte Handwerksberufe denken, wenn ähm, gerade so die Restauratoren im Handwerk, die sich ja auch, wir hatten jetzt gerade auf unserem Studierenden-Workshop einen ähm, Zimmermann, Zimmermannsmeister dabei, der jetzt Holz, Holzingenieurwesen studiert und wo man auch so das Gefühl hatte, da, da wird im Grunde auch altes Wissen, äh, was der übers Handwerk mitbringt, ähm, jetzt wieder reaktiviert, auch fürs Neue. Und, äh, ja, damit würde ich auch aufhören. Ja, ja, vielen Dank, Frau Wendland, für den Hinweis auf das Handwerk und das ja sowohl im Bereich der Bauforschung und der archäologischen Forschung in den letzten Jahren da schon ähm, Quellen sozusagen reaktiviert oder deutlich gemacht worden. Jetzt habe ich, sehe ich zwei Meldungen, nämlich von Frau Kruse und von Frau Lörzel. Frau Kruse? Ja, ähm, ich würde vielleicht zu dem Handwerk noch ergänzen. Äh, es gibt ja die Jugendbauhütten, äh, die äh, betreut werden in der Regel von eben ähm, erfahrenen äh, älteren Handwerkern und die das gleich weitergeben. Das heißt, da hätte man zusätzlich auch noch eine wichtige zukünftige Gruppe von Akteuren. Das heißt, wenn man diese Kooperation verstärken könnte oder die Jugendbauhütten äh, stärker finanziell ausstatten könnte. Das ist eine Sache. Dann, ähm, es gibt ja ähm, 
zunehmend mehr Einträge in die Liste des immateriellen Kulturerbes der UNESCO und dazu gehören zum Beispiel das Wissen darüber, wie man alte, also wie man Steinmauern, äh, Trockensteinmauern erstellt, ist ein Eintrag und so weiter. Also es gibt ja da eine ganze Menge äh, Einträge, die sich mit handwerklichem Wissen, mit Landbewirtschaftungswissen beschäftigen. Das heißt, da, äh, das ist sicherlich auch eine sehr reichhaltige Quelle. Und ähm, und die Landwirtschaft würde ich halt äh, definitiv gerne ins Feld führen, äh, als ähm, doch ja. also ein, ein unglaublicher Quell an Wissen, die aber äh, ganz selten in Kooperation und im Austausch stehen mit zum Beispiel ähm, Prozessen im Bereich der Regionalplanung, äh, im Bereich der äh, Kulturlandschaftsentwicklung, ähm, die selten zu den Treffen kommen. Also das heißt, da müsste man schauen, ob man da auch einen besseren Zugang zu bekommt. Ja. Ähm, ich habe jetzt noch drei Wortmeldungen, die vielleicht, die wir einfach noch mal weiter sammeln und dann gucken, wie wir das möglicherweise schon abschließen. Frau Scheuermann habe ich hier, Herr Kilian und, äh, und Frau Lörzel hat es sich gemeldet, sogar als Erste gemeldet, wenn ich mich richtig erinnere. Frau Lörzel, dann bitte. Ähm, ja, also ich wollte äh, von den Erfahrungen vom Hochwasser letztes Jahr ähm, noch ergänzen, dass es wirklich auch in vielen Ortschaften dann auch nach dem Hochwasser so ein bisschen hieß, ja, das war doch, das war doch irgendwie vor 100 Jahren auch schon mal und, und da lief es wohl schon mal öfter äh, richtig schlimm durch den, durch den Ort. Aber das passiert halt nicht häufig und das ist eben auch noch nicht äh, wirklich in den, ähm, ja, in den Geschichtsschreibung von Hochwasser mit drin, ähm, weil das ja eben auch nicht die klassischen Orte sind, wo man diese äh, Hochwasser findet. Ähm, gleichzeitig ist das Wissen aber doch irgendwie so schwammig ja noch da. Also das äh, wollte ich nur äh, anmerken, dass es in, den, in solchen kleinen Ortschaften, äh, in denen es da wirklich Familien gibt, die da schon hunderte von Jahren leben, dass da immer mal so, so Wissen über solche in Anführungszeichen Katastrophen durchaus noch vorhanden sind, die vielleicht bei der Stadtplanung und bei, äh, bei den Behörden, die ja die politische Verantwortung tragen, eigentlich gar nicht so präsent ist und nicht so richtig ankommt. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich meine, die Frage ist ja, ob wir als Denkmalpflege, ich bezeichne mal jetzt uns alle so, aber vielleicht bin es auch nur ich in ausgeprägtem Maße, ähm, ob wir überhaupt über die Kontakte verfügen, dass wir das, was in den letzten Jahren an Umweltgeschichtsforschung eigentlich betrieben wurde, ob wir das überhaupt alles zur Kenntnis nehmen, wie auch umgekehrt vielleicht da noch der Austausch intensiviert werden kann. Frau Scheuermann und dann Herr Kilian und Frau Kaiser. Ja, ich möchte ganz kurz eine Bemerkung zu dem Thema der Knowledge Systems, was wir ja eben äh, mehrfach äh, diskutiert gesehen haben. Und ich fände es wichtig, auch für unsere weiteren Diskussionen über die Form, die Geschichte der Spezialisierung unserer Wissenssysteme, gerade auch mhm. im Bereich des kulturellen Erbes, noch mal kritisch nachzudenken. Wir haben eigentlich in den letzten 200 Jahren uns immer weiter spezialisiert und ähm, in meiner Perspektive immer weniger den Dialog untereinander eingebüßt. Und ich glaube, dass das jetzt dringend notwendig ist, dass wir unser Know-how bündeln, auch innerhalb unserer Disziplinen. Äh, Ulrike Wendland erwähnte eben die Archäologen, die Natur- und Umweltschützer, wir haben immer so parallele Geschichten mit einigen Berührungspunkten, aber wir haben, wenn wir über Erbe nachgedacht haben, jeder in seinem Wissenssystem agiert. Und ich glaube, das wäre für uns ein ganz wesentlicher erster Schritt, um da Wissen zu bündeln und zu überlegen, wo sind eigentlich Ansatzpunkte, an die wir jetzt sinnvollerweise auch mit unseren spezifischen Fragestellungen hier anknüpfen können. Und da gibt ja. es eine ganze Menge. Ja, vielen Dank, Frau Scheuermann. Herr Kilian. Ich wollte noch mal zurückkommen auf die Ausgangsfrage, und zwar nach dem Indigenous Knowledge. Und ähm, ich, aus meiner Sicht, ähm, denke ich, haben wir da ähm, zwei Aspekte, ähm, die man auf jeden Fall verfolgen sollte. Zum einen ist vieles, was wir wissen über traditionelles Bauen, sind nachhaltige oder sehr nachhaltige Materialien, die 
ähm, mehr oder weniger aus erneuerbaren Ressourcen stammen. Ähm, Stichwort Holz, ähm, wenn Sie sich anhören, was ähm, Schellnuber sagt, ist, ähm, der sagt, man muss eigentlich zurück äh, wieder dazu, dass man mit Holz baut, ähm, um ja. einfach nur zwei im Gebäudebestand zu speichern. Und ähm, auch letztendlich Lehm ist ein äh, regionales Produkt. Und wenn man sogar über, über Kalk nachdenkt, gebrannter Kalk, der wird mit, wurde früher mit Holz gebrannt und kam aus der Region. Also eigentlich könnte man sagen, auch das ist ein ökologisches Produkt. Und ähm, genau danach wird heutzutage gesucht. Und ich denke, da haben wir eben vieles an Wissen da. Und der zweite Aspekt, den ich noch ähm, erwähnen wollte, ist eben tatsächlich die, die Wertschätzung von Dingen. Ähm, wir haben Gebäude, die wir ganz, ganz lange nutzen. Wir haben auch Gegenstände. Und ähm, das ist, glaube ich, das, was in der Gesellschaft vielleicht ein bisschen fehlt, ähm, dass man den Dingen wieder mehr Wert gibt. Und da, ähm, glaube ich, können wir wirklich was wir auch vorhin in Vorträgen gehört haben, ähm, darauf aufbauen und Kultur benutzen, um damit ähm, ja, zu argumentieren im besten Sinne. Und ähm, die Hauptfrage aus meiner Sicht ist, wie tragen wir das in die Breite? Also wie kriegen wir das ähm, auf die Straße? Ja, das heben wir uns nochmal auf für die letzten zehn Minuten, Herr Kiel. Da müssen wir das sowieso weiter besprechen oder uns vielleicht auch nochmal neu verabreden. Frau Kaiser, Dankeschön. Ja, danke schön. Ich hoffe, man hört mich. Also ich wollte ganz gerne nochmal anknüpfen an das, was Frau Lörze gesagt hat. Und wenn man dieses Thema Bauforschung, Archäologie noch ein bisschen runterbricht, heißt es ja schon, wir haben ja die Gebäude selbst, die uns schon zeigen, in welcher Gefährdungslage sie sind in Bezug auf zum Beispiel dann tatsächlich auf die Frage Flut natürlich, Hochwasser. Es gibt die Hochwassermarken an den Gebäuden, die man schlichtweg übersehen hat und die man jetzt erst wieder gefunden hat. Es gibt aber auch das sehr breit gestreute Wissen in den regionalen ähm, Literatur, also Heimatjahrbüchern, äh, wo man hätte zum Beispiel für das Ahrtal heraussehen können, dass eigentlich schon seit dem 15. Jahrhundert bekannt ist, dass dieses Ahrtal als Canyon schon durch Fluten entstanden ist. Und wenn wir da eine Denkmaltopografie gemacht hätten, wäre uns wahrscheinlich das auch aufgefallen. Und so haben wir dieses Wissen, was verborgen ist in, in sekundären Quellen, ähm, leider erst zu spät sozusagen wieder erobert. Also das, ähm, also ich muss einfach diesen ganzen Prozess von unten äh, betrachten und finde es großartig, dass man sozusagen diese globale Perspektive jetzt wirklich mit den konkreten Erfahrungen in der Vorort äh, verbinden kann. Und das, glaube ich, ähm, zeigt uns dann auch den Weg. Ja, vielen Dank für die Meldungen. Wenn ich richtig überblicke und richtig bemerkt habe, haben wir natürlich jetzt alles sozusagen doch aus einer, mehr oder weniger aus einer Konservatorenperspektive heraus überlegt, welche historische Erfahrungen gibt es, die man reaktivieren, die man sich wieder bewusst machen kann und welche Fehlentscheidungen oder Fehlentwicklungen oder fragwürdige Entwicklungen gab es möglicherweise, die auch ihrerseits bedacht und korrigiert werden sollte, siehe Spezialisierung äh, gegen sozusagen ein integriertes oder integrierteres äh, Wissen. Für, für mich wäre noch mal interessant, wenn wir Hinweise bekommen auf andere Wissenssysteme, also auf Systeme von Wissen und Wissenschaft, von, es ist jetzt hier gesagt worden, von, von Locals, Nationals und, und Globals sozusagen, aber man kann sich das ja auch von Natur und Kultur und anderen historischen Disziplinen vorstellen. Welches wären diese Wissenssysteme? Ich frage das deshalb, weil das für mich der Schlüssel im Grunde genommen auch dafür wäre, wer müsste mit angesprochen sein. Ich glaube, dass wir hier zum Beispiel einen Kreis haben, der bis auf Herrn Lohner oder andere, ich befür, dass er wahrscheinlich ziemlich denkmalaffin ist, aber sozusagen die ganze Klima-, Naturschutz- und ökologische Seite nicht gut repräsentiert. Und dass auch das Thema des immateriellen Erbes, dass man das vielleicht noch verbessern kann. Das heißt, ich überlege einfach, was müssten eigentlich nächste Schritte sein und wer wären mögliche Ansprechpartner, die man mit einbeziehen sollte. Und das frage ich auch vor dem Hintergrund der UNESCO oder des materiellen und immateriellen Erbes, ob nicht das Thema Welterbe tatsächlich so abgegriffen das ist, aber ob das nicht auch eine Chance wäre, um diese unterschiedlichen Erbschaften mal zusammen zu denken und die UNESCO, die deutsche UNESCO-Kommission, wie auch andere UNESCO-Kommissionen, die haben das ja sozusagen organisatorisch als ihren Auftrag, einschließlich der, der Natur und, und der Wissenschaft. Und ob das nicht dann ein Plattform oder ein Forum sein könnte, wo man diese Diskussion über die Integration von Wissenssystemen ein Stück weit voranbringen kann. Jetzt habe ich dazu noch ganz viele Meldungen offenbar provoziert von Frau Kruse über Herrn Lohner, Frau Redel, Norbert Kühn, Frau Lörzel nochmal und Caroline Kolloff. Damit ist die UNESCO ja hier. Gut, sehr schön. 
äh, Frau Große. Ja, dann oute ich mich als Nicht-Denkmalpflegerin, also auf jeden Fall nicht in erster Linie, <lacht> sondern ich bin ja, äh, ich komme ja von der Kulturlandschaftsseite, äh, genau in der Vermittlung äh, zwischen Landwirtschaft und Naturschutz, so hat es angefangen, äh, indem ich halt äh, meine Doktorarbeit darüber geschrieben habe, äh, was der aktuelle Naturschutz aus einer historischen Kulturlandschaftsanalyse lernen kann. Und das ist der, der Grund, warum ich mich hier einschalte. Ähm, das Wissen, welche unserer Landschaftselemente, unserer Kulturlandschaftselemente, äh, welchen Beitrag zum Klimaschutz leisten können, das halte ich äh, für extrem wichtig und vielleicht auch noch für zu wenig präsent. Also äh, einfach, dass das ich meine, dass ein nicht bewachsener Boden stärker für Erosion anfällig ist, das weiß jeder mittlerweile. Aber dass eine, ein, ähm, ähm, der, der, die Humusschicht eines, einer Wiese, also Wiese eines Grünlandes, ähm, mehr CO2 bindet als die Humusschicht eines Ackers, das ist vielleicht schon weniger bekannt. Und das lässt sich also in, äh, sofort in ganz, an ganz vielen Beispielen äh, eben zeigen und äh, ich denke, dieses Wissen müsste stärker in der Klimaschutzdebatte auch Einfluss finden. Also welche Elemente sollten auch bei einer Neugestaltung eine, eine, eines Parks, wenn ich ganz klein anfange, ähm, welchen sollte der Vorzug gegeben werden? Ja, Einfach vielen, aus Klimaschutzgründen. Und, vielen Dank, äh, Frau, Frau Kruse. Ich glaube, es ist wichtig, bei den Kulturlandschaften sozusagen den, den Landschafts- oder den ökologischen Wert mit zu bedenken und nicht nur den historischen. Haben Sie Verständnis dafür, wenn ich jetzt diejenigen vorziehe, die noch nichts gesagt haben, äh, weil ich selber schon zehn Minuten über die Zeit bin und eigentlich weitergeben müsste an Frau Bösler. Frau Riedl, ach, Herr, Herr Lohner zuerst, dann Frau Riedl und dann Herr Kühn und dann und Frau Kolloff, und dann gehen wir noch mal zu, zu Frau Lörze. Herr Lohner. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Hasten. Äh, Herbert Lohner, ich bin vom BUND Berlin, diesem Umweltverband. Und also ich glaube, es gibt eine Menge äh, Anknüpfungspunkte. Und ähm, zum einen, also soweit ich das von, von den Verbandsorganisationen kenne, gibt es sowohl beim NABO als auch beim BUND eine Menge vor Ort Gruppen die sich um Objekte kümmern, die gleichzeitig Naturschutz und Denkmalwürdig oder Wert haben. Das, da wir aber basisorientiert sind, hat eigentlich keiner in den einen großen Überblick, was da wirklich überall läuft, aber da läuft einiges. Das andere ist, Herr Hasbe, wir hatten ja vor einigen Jahren mal eine gemeinsame Tagung zu diesem Weltkulturerbe Green Belt Europe durchgeführt. Das heißt, es gibt zumindest beim BUND eine große Offenheit für Kooperationen mit E-Commerce zum Beispiel. Das hat auch in letzter Zeit, in den letzten Monaten dazu geführt, dass wir in unserem Gesamtverband einen Arbeitskreis Kultur und Natur gegründet haben, der ganz am Anfang ist. Da gibt es auch in den nächsten Wochen einen Termin mit Olaf Zimmermann, der da mit drin ist, vom Deutschen Kulturrat. Das heißt, es wäre, glaube ich, strategisch sehr günstig, relativ bald mit Olaf Zimmermann Kontakt aufzunehmen als E-Commerce, weil wir sind bei der Themenfindung noch relativ am Anfang, muss ich ehrlicherweise gestehen. Also das ist einfach zum, zum Praktischen. Ja. Zum anderen ist es aber auch so, dass Klimawandel ja auch Wissenssysteme erschüttert. Also das heißt, es gibt im Naturschutz dogmatisches Wissen, wo ich nicht weiß, ob das äh, den Klimawandel überlebt. Und da müsste man auch sich selbst in Frage stellen. Also gilt vielleicht auch für den Denkmalschutz, da kann ich es nicht so sagen. Aber also ich würde Sie auf jeden Fall einladen, äh, den Kontakt zu suchen. Und äh, wenn es nötig ist, bin ich gerne bereit, dabei behilflich zu sein. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Lohner, dass Sie dazu gestoßen sind und für die Hinweise. Frau Riedl. Mein Kommentar wäre in die gleiche Richtung gegangen, also auch den Kontakt zum NABU zum Beispiel äh, zu suchen, weil gerade ja dort ganz viel mit äh, traditioneller Wasserwirtschaft, äh, Kulturlandschaftspflege gerade auch passiert und das sich gegenseitig sehr befruchten würde. Und würde aber auch nochmal betonen, dass man hier vielleicht auch noch ein paar historische Untersuchungen machen müsste, weil sich in der gerade in der Landschaft, Kulturlandschaft sich in den letzten Jahrzehnten ja wahnsinnig viel geändert hat und man auch vom NABU jetzt wieder auf historische 
Bewirtschaftungsform ja wieder zurückgehen möchte oder auch erstmal die wieder erkunden muss. Also da wären auch noch sehr viele Anknüpfungspunkte, die man, glaube ich, gemeinsam mal untersuchen könnte. Vielen Dank, Frau Redel. Herr Kühn. Ja, guten Tag. Kühn, die in Berlin. Wir haben in der Gartendenkmalpflege schon mehrere Projekte, trans- und interdisziplinäre, gemacht zur Klimafrage und zur, zu den Gartendenkmalen. Uns ist dabei ganz stark aufgefallen, dass insbesondere naturwissenschaftliche Daten für Gartendenkmale zum Beispiel teilweise überhaupt nicht oder nur sehr defizitär vorhanden sind. Das heißt also Boden, äh, Bodendaten oder hydrologische Daten oder teilweise auch biologische Daten, die extrem wichtig wären, äh, gerade im Klimawandel, um auch diese Gartendenkmäler zu erhalten. Noch dazu ist es so, dass es auch für diejenigen, für die naturwissenschaftlichen Disziplinen teilweise unglaublich spannend ist, in einen Boden mal zu forschen, der 300 Jahre gleichmäßig äh, beackert worden, gleichmäßig bearbeitet worden ist und nicht wie außerhalb zerstört, gestört äh, und landwirtschaftlich genutzt worden ist. Also ich glaube, hier gibt es ein relativ breites Spektrum an Wissen, was bisher für zumindest die Gartendenkmale nicht aufgearbeitet ist und was sehr wichtig wäre, um auch die in der Klimafrage hier vorwärts zu kommen. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Kühn. Frau Kolloff. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Professor Haspel, ähm, Caroline Kolloff, Deutsche UNESCO-Kommission. Äh, Sie hatten äh, uns eben äh, explizit angesprochen, genannt. Ähm, ich freue mich sehr, dass ich heute dabei bin bei der Runde. Ich leite den Fachbereich Welterbe bei der Deutschen UNESCO-Kommission. Und es ist natürlich genauso, wie Sie eben gesagt haben, das weiß ich auch, dass Sie das wissen, dass wir als Nationalkommission für die UNESCO natürlich die ganzen Bereiche der UNESCO, in denen die UNESCO arbeitet, abdecken. Dazu gehört immaterielles Kulturerbe, im Welterbe allein Genau das, was wir hier auch diskutieren, nämlich Naturerbe, Kulturerbe und alles auch, was dazwischen ist, nämlich die ganzen Kulturlandschaften und die ähm, Welterbestätten. Sie sagten das gerade eben, Herr Kühn, die ähm, zum Beispiel ähm, Parks und äh, Gartenlandschaften sind, die äh, haben ja alle Welterbestätten. Wir merken das auch gerade, das ist jetzt auch keine Überraschung, weil das ja insgesamt gesellschaftlich gerade so ist, dass der Klimawandel, wir merken ihn an allen Ecken und Enden, gerade auch die Welterbestätten sehr, sehr betrifft und beschäftigt und auch den Umgang damit. Und es ist tatsächlich, deswegen biete ich das gerne, gerne an, auch noch mal verstärkt auch Ihr Angebot bei uns ins Haus zu tragen. Es ist natürlich so, dass wir auch ähm, darauf reagieren wollen ähm, in Form von, wir selbst sind natürlich keine Klimaforscherin, Klimaforscher, aber wir, wir vernetzen, wir, wir unterstützen Vermittlungsarbeit äh, zu den einzelnen Themen und da ist Klimawandel in Verbindung zu dem, was wir jetzt heute hier gerade besprechen, natürlich ein ganz wichtiges Thema. Das dazu von meiner Seite. Vielen, vielen Dank, Frau Kohler. Vielen Dank, dass Sie dabei waren und auch vielen Dank für das Angebot. Und vielleicht kann man ja eine der Welterbe- und Jugend- und Erziehungstagungen, die wir in Leipzig alle zwei Jahre machen, auch mal genau. dem Ökologie-Thema ausschließen. Haben, haben wir jetzt sogar ja. auch in Zusammenarbeit mit Ihnen. Genau, das war die, Sie wissen. Ich genau. würde das schon für 2024 dahingehend nur spezifizieren, dass ich sage, jetzt nehmen wir uns doch mal die Welterbezentren vor die Brust, die alle überall entstehen und was die über das Welterbe erzählen und was eigentlich die aktuelle Frage ist. Das wäre nämlich die Reaktion eigentlich, diese Welterbevermittlungsinstanzen zu nutzen als Plattform und als Multiplikator zu ökologischem und Klimawissen. Und da wäre zum Beispiel, könnte dann Herr Kühn, könnte man wunderbar die Situation der Schlösser und Gärten in Berlin, aber auch Wörlitz oder anderes, weil in Welterbeinformationszentren an die breite Öffentlichkeit geben. Das wird nämlich viel weniger gemacht als die Information über historische, kulturelle und sonstige Werte. Das ist aber nicht das, was im Augenblick brisant ist, habe ich so den Eindruck. Und deshalb so meine Überlegung, da haben Sie kann, recht, das das Welterbe, kann man das Welterbe nicht nutzen, weil das die, der ideale Multiplikator ist. Es hat eine hohe Aufmerksamkeit, es hat eine hohe Wertschätzung und es könnte auch eine Modellwirkung haben. Mir geht es nicht darum, das sozusagen abzusetzen vom Rest, sondern zu sagen, das muss multipliziert werden. Und wenn wir es beim Welterbe nicht schaffen, dann schaffen wir es beim Rest auch nicht unbedingt leichter. 
Jetzt hatte sich Frau Treu noch gemeldet, habe ich richtig gesehen, und würde damit den Reigen abschließen. Und ich würde gleich Dorothee Bösler bitten, das zu übernehmen. Es hat sich ein bisschen noch übrig. Ich glaube, es kommt dann an einem anderen Punkt besser ran. Alles klar. Ich bedanke mich für die erste Gesprächsrunde und gebe weiter an Frau Bösler. Ja, vielen Dank. Ähm, die, wir sprechen eben jetzt über diese Actions, die im General Research and Action Agenda heute Morgen auch vorgestellt worden sind. Frau Baudes hatte die jetzt auch in den Chat gestellt. Und ich, wir wollten jetzt gerne uns noch mal kurz austauschen über die Action 2, Maßnahmen zur Befähigung von Akteuren im Bereich Kultur und kulturelles Erbe zum Handeln. Wir haben uns jetzt auch wieder ganz viele Fragen überlegt. Ich würde jetzt vielleicht mit einer Frage äh, starten wollen und das damit vielleicht dann auch schon direkt wieder abschließen. Ähm, die Frage, die auch anknüpft an das, was uns Hanna empfiehlt. Was kann ich selbst mit meiner eigenen Einrichtung und Institution zum Thema Befähigung von Akteuren im Bereich Kultur und kulturelles Erbe äh, zum Handeln anzuregen? Was kann ich mit meiner eigenen Institution da schon leisten? Vielleicht hat der ein oder andere Beispiele, die wir sammeln können, dass, man, dass wir uns da vielleicht auf so eine Frage fokussieren. Was machen wir eigentlich selber konkret? Herr Bellendorf, vielen Dank, dass Sie das Eis brechen. <lacht> Ja, vielleicht mal als erster Aufschlag. Ähm, wir sind ja von der Uni Bamberg, ich bin von der Uni Bamberg. Und eine Aktion, die wir jetzt gestartet haben, ist ähm, mit Fördermitteln des ähm, Umweltministeriums. Ist, wir haben ein Projekt jetzt gestartet mit dem Titel Schadensprävention für Kulturgüter in Zeiten des Klimawandels, ähm, wo wir zusammen mit dem Fraunhofer IBP-Institut gerade jetzt dabei sind in den nächsten zwei Jahren, eine Seminarreihe aufzustellen, die sowohl an der Uni Bamberg dann als in der Lehre stattfinden soll, als auch später am ähm, ähm, Fraunhofer Zentrum in Benedikt-Beuern ähm, für quasi nicht-universitäre Personen, wo es darum geht, ähm, um Fragen des Klimawandels im Umgang mit Baudenkmälern oder Ähnliches zu erarbeiten. Ein Part davon ist die Auswertung der zigtausend Karten, die aus dem äh, Climate for Culture EU-Projekt noch raus sind. Ähm, das ist so ein Part, den wir jetzt mal als Universität zusammen mit einer Forschungseinrichtung versuchen, um uns diesem Thema zu nähern. Jetzt müssen wir aber ganz klar sagen, ohne externe Fördermittel hätten wir uns jetzt nicht auf diese Art und Weise diesen Fragestellungen genähert. Ähm, wir versuchen das Thema bei uns an der Uni in dem Masterstudiengang Denkmalpflege mit reinzubringen, Dort findet es aber offiziell im Curriculum momentan nicht statt. Das müssen wir ganz klar sagen. Ähm, wir versuchen das Thema immer unterschwellig oder bei einigen Themen, wo es reinpasst, ähm, mitzunehmen. Ähm, grundsätzlich müsste man jetzt für uns als Lehrbetrieb wahrscheinlich ähm, wirklich eigene Module, Klimawandel, Anpassungsstrategien und Ähnliches mit aufnehmen. Ähm, es findet statt, aber eher so unterschwellig. Und das Projekt, das wir jetzt gerade gestartet haben oder wo wir gerade seit, seit Mai dran sitzen, wie gesagt, da ist die große Chance, die wir gesehen haben, dass es halt eine Ausschreibung dazu gab. Und ähm, das ist jetzt wahrscheinlich bei vielen Punkten, die wir heute diskutieren, äh, immer die Sache, wie kriegen wir sowas ins Tagesgeschäft unter, wenn wir nicht externe Mittel haben, um dann die Freiräume zu haben, um uns konkret mit den Themen zu beschäftigen. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Wellendorf. Birte. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank für diese super spannende Diskussion. Was mir jetzt dabei einfällt, was können wir in unseren kleinsten kleinen Einheiten bewegen? Ich aus dem Bereich der Denkmalpflege kommend, das Referat Restaurierung bei uns im Hause leitend, verbunden mit der praktischen Denkmalpflege. Wir beraten praktische Maßnahmen an den Denkmälern. Dazu gehört natürlich auch die Schäden zu erkennen und festzustellen, woher rührt denn der Schaden? Und an genau dieser Stelle fahren wir das Programm, was wir bisher die letzten Jahre immer gefahren sind, der Schadenserkennung. Aber jetzt kommt vielleicht zusätzlich die Frage dazu, wie stellt sich denn dieser Schaden vor dem Hintergrund des Klimawandels und der Zunahme von Extremwetterlagen dar? Hat, hat diese Situation zu dem Schadensverlauf vielleicht schon beigetragen oder würde 
ein zunehmender Klimawandel, oder würde der Klimawandel, das ist jetzt doppelt, ähm, würde der Klimawandel diesen Schadensverlauf vielleicht auch sogar noch verstärken. Und das heißt dann im Hinblick auf die Maßnahme, ähm, Wel zu welcher Maßnahme berate ich jetzt hier, die nicht nur diesen Schaden, den ich jetzt offensichtlich sehe, angeht, behebt und präventiv in, für die Zukunft auch das Denkmal schützt vor weiterem Schadensverlauf, sondern diese Maßnahme auch noch überprüft im Hinblick auf die Nachhaltigkeit zunehmender Extremwetterlagen. Ganz simple Sache, ähm, wir haben Drainagen an den, an den ähm, Bauwerken, ähm, diese Drainagen sind berechnet, dass sie ein bestimmtes Wasservolumen ableiten, auffangen können. Sind diese Berechnungen für diese Drainagen überhaupt noch belastbar oder müssen die neu berechnet werden? Also sogar ganz, ganz, ganz simpel, blutig, krautig, aber das sind so die kleinen Stellschrauben. Ich glaube, da, wenn jeder mit so einem kleinen, detaillierten Blick auf sein, sein Tun blickt, findet man, glaube ich, immer wieder Stellen, an denen man fragen kann, wie stellt sich denn diese Situation da, wenn ich mir vorstelle, Extremwetterlagen? Die sind ja auch von Region zu Region unterschiedlich. Extremwetterlagen nehmen zu. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Kilian. Ja, vielleicht auch noch ein Gedanke, weil die Frage ist ja empowering people, also wie man ähm, sozusagen ja, die Leute befähigt. Und ähm, was die Bette Grau gerade gesagt hat, ist wirklich eine der Schwierigkeiten, ist, dass, dass vieles sehr abstrakt ist. Aber ich denke, dass wenn man es schafft, dass man im Kleinen vielleicht beginnt, dass man also in den Institutionen vielleicht kleinere Arbeitskreise schafft, die sich einfach vielleicht einmal im Monat zusammensetzen und sich überlegen, okay, wo betrifft uns denn der Klimawandel in dem, was wir tun? Ähm, dann hat man da vielleicht auch eine gegenseitige Unterstützung, um das, um das zu erweitern. Also ich, ich glaube, ganz viel zu tun ist immer noch in... Ähm, darin herauszufinden, wo genau, die, wo genau die Schwierigkeiten sind und wo genau unsere Ansatzpunkte sind. Mhm. Ja, vielen Dank. Frau Scheuermann? Frau Scheuermann, wir hören Sie nicht. Sie, haben, äh, Sie müssen sich... Entschuldigung, wo man eigentlich inzwischen <lacht> können. Pardon. Das ist jetzt jeder. Ähm, ich finde es wichtig, was die Kolleginnen und Kollegen gesagt haben, dass man alle Möglichkeiten, die man in seiner Praxis hat, nutzt, ob es in der Praxis der Denkmalpflege ist oder an den Universitäten. Ich finde es für uns aber auch wichtig, darüber nachzudenken, ob der Klimawandel und die Herausforderungen, die mit ihm verbunden sind, nicht auch unser grundsätzliches Verständnis von Denkmalpflege ändern ändern müssen, ändern werden. Und das haben wir eben in den äh, internationalen Beiträgen ja festgestellt, dass da so traditionelle Grenzen zwischen Disziplinen ähm, überwunden werden, dass wir immer wieder dieses Stichwort der äh, Transformation gehört haben. Und ich fände es wichtig, bei Akteuren eben über das Kleine nachzudenken, aber auch über das Grundsätzliche. Das kann man jetzt nicht in der Viertelstunde aber ich glaube, das sollten wir nicht aus dem Blick ähm, verlieren, dass das unser Fach genauso, wie es die Archäologie, wie es den Naturschutz verändert, aber auch verändern wird und schon tut. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich ähm, bitte jetzt die, die sich jetzt gemeldet haben, noch zu Wort und würde damit aber auch die Rednerliste schließen. Frau Treu war aus meiner Sicht die Nächste. Würden Sie kurz Ihre Institution noch mal sagen? Mhm. Eurek Research in Bozen bzw. Hochschule Coburg. Ich weiß, ich habe meinen Beitrag jetzt schon ein bisschen zu konkret, zu sehr uh, on the ground, zu wenig theoretisch wird. Um, was ich sehe, ist, dass wir ja auch das Thema Klimawandel begrenzen, ganz stark als Thema der nächsten Jahre, Jahrzehnte haben. Und da sehe ich um, eine Möglichkeit, die ich im Konkreten habe, sowohl mit den Studierenden der digitalen Denkmaltechnologien, aber auch mit den Architekten, die ja auch ganz viel in dem Bereich in Zukunft gestalten werden, ähm, dass es ganz wichtig ist, dass die praktisch das Wissen und die Methoden in die Hand bekommen, wie sie mit unserem Erbe, mit historischen Städten, mit historischen Gebäuden umgehen, um praktisch beides zu erreichen, den Erhalt der Werte und gleichzeitig praktisch das Vermeiden von, von CO2. Und es geht 
Darüber, dass man selbstbewusst sagt, es gibt gute Lösungen, es gibt andere Lösungen, da stimmt man keinen Hut drüber, bis zu ähm, Lebenszyklusanalysen, solche Dinge, wo man sehr viel positiv praktisch aufzeigen kann. Wir haben auch probiert, über praktisch ja, die, die Studierenden hinaus äh, Ele Elemente zu schaffen. Zum Beispiel, ich weiß nicht, wie sehr, ich habe leider die Präsentation vom Paper 3 heute verpasst, weil ich an einem parallelen Treffen war, aber was wir als Eurak dort beigetragen hatten, war der, der Hyper Atlas, wo wir Best Practice Beispiele sammeln und vermitteln, die auch wirklich sich an die, ähm, an die Hausbesitzer und an die Architekten wenden, um irgendwo die Themen positiv besetzt ähm, rauszubringen. Ja, vielen Dank. Die nächste die in meiner Liste wäre Frau Kruse. Alexandra. Ja, danke. Ähm, ja, an jedes Wort anschließend von Frau Treu ähm, würde ich gerne noch vorschlagen, dass ähm, man sich auch noch mal wieder vor Augen führen muss, dass äh, alles, was wir heute als Denkmale haben, äh, das waren alles Dinge, die irgendwann mal neu waren und die zum damaligen Zeitpunkt dem Stand der Zeit entsprochen haben. Und insofern, wenn man mit vielen Menschen spricht, nicht nur im Naturschutzbereich und nicht nur im Kulturlandschaftsbereich, sondern auch im Baubereich, wird sehr oft der Denkmalpflege ein, ein, also negativ entgegengekommen, weil man sie als eine Verhinderung sieht. Und ich glaube, das wäre auch etwas, woran man also in Zukunft arbeiten muss, äh, dass eben klar ist, äh, Denkmalpflege erhält etwas, aber sie ist deswegen nicht gegen Fortschritt, sie ist nicht gegen etwas Zeitgemäßes. Und da, da denke ich, müsste eine ganze Menge gearbeitet werden. Und ähm, so wie Frau Treu vorgeschlagen hatte, dass im Prinzip von jeder unserer eigenen Aktionen auch ein Vorbild ausgehen muss, so müsste auch von, bei jeder Aktion immer versucht werden, wenn es irgendwie geht, sich gleich an mehrere Generationen zu wenden. Mehrere Generationen, äh, die einen als Vermissens Vermittlungs- und Wissensträger und die anderen als die zukünftigen Akteure. Und dementsprechend auch, dass man sich in seiner ganzen Vermittlung auf unterschiedliche Kommunikationsformen und unterschiedliche Kommunikationskanäle begibt. Und dafür brauchen wir alleine schon Kooperation, die aus unseren eigenen Fachgebieten herausgeht, weil wir sind da ja gar nicht ausgebildet äh, und verfügen nicht über dieses Wissen. Also ich weiß, die Zeit ist begrenzt, deswegen höre ich hier auf, aber da denke ich, gibt es viel zu tun. Ja, vielen Dank, Alexandra. Ähm, dann darf ich übergehen äh, zur Achso, ja, Frau Mattia, Sie hatten sich auch noch gemeldet. Sie haben jetzt zurückgezogen. Ja, es hat sich auch alles so ein bisschen überschnitten. Ich wollte einmal ähm, anknüpfen an äh, Herrn Kilian. Also das ist bei uns, ich bin von der Stiftung Preußische Schlösser und Gärten in Brandenburg. Wir haben jetzt zum Beispiel eben auch äh, AGs eingerichtet, die sich damit beschäftigen. Also was können wir machen, Klimawandel in Bezug auf Gehölze, auf Wege, äh, auf Stoffkreisläufe und auf Wasser. Ähm, das ist wichtig, aber eben auch, es ist sehr wichtig, das nach außen zu tragen. Dazu haben wir jetzt gerade in dieser Woche ähm, auch ein DBU-gefördertes äh, Projekt bei uns zu Gast, ähm, Young Climate Action for World Heritage. Also da ist es genau so, dass aus verschiedenen UNESCO-Schulen äh, Schülerinnen und Schüler zwischen 14 und 17 bei uns sind und wir versuchen eben zu vermitteln, was tun wir, was sind unsere Probleme. Ähm, und dann ja, wollte ich auch noch zu dem, was Frau Scheuermann gesagt hat, äh, daran mich so ein bisschen anschließen, dass man wahrscheinlich auch das so ein bisschen grundsätzlich trotzdem auch überdenken muss. Was heißt jetzt Denkmalpflege in Zeiten des Klimawandels und muss man da eben vielleicht auch äh, sich ein bisschen korrigieren ähm, in bestimmten Grundsätzen, die bisher gegolten haben? Ja, das war es eigentlich schon. Ja, vielen Dank, Frau Matthäa. Dann ähm, darf ich übergeben zu äh, Konstanze Fuhrmann. Genau, wir haben jetzt nur noch ein paar Minuten Zeit. Ich wollte noch mal ganz kurz Ihre Motivation erfragen. Wir hatten uns vorgenommen, eigentlich noch mal ein, zwei weitere Fragen zu adressieren. Einmal die Frage Zusammenarbeit zwischen Forschung, Politik und 
Praxis, da wollten wir ihre Erfahrungswerte nochmal wissen und auch den Aspekt Maßnahmen zur Finanzierung und wollten dann mit Ihnen auch nochmal ganz kurz über das Positionspapier sprechen, was wir jetzt auch noch im Anschluss der heutigen Veranstaltung und zum Abschluss des Projektes Vorhaben zu formulieren. Wie sieht es jetzt gerade aus bei Ihnen? Wie erschöpft sind Sie? Ähm, wir könnten noch ganz kurz diese Fragen anreißen. Äh, eine kurze Frage mit der Bitte um kurze Antwort oder sollen wir jetzt einfach direkt übergehen in äh, die Diskussion zu dem Positionspapier? Vielleicht könnten Sie mir ganz kurz mitteilen, wie erschöpft Sie sind. Wir haben alle einen langen Tag oder ob Sie noch bereit sind, zehn Minuten länger zu diskutieren. Vielleicht einmal kurz den Daumen hoch oder runter. Okay, das ist der Daumen hoch. Okay, super. Wir können es ja trotzdem kurz halten. Also was uns jetzt auch noch mal interessieren würde, wären Ihre Erfahrungswerte zu Maßnahmen zur Förderung einer sinnvollen Zusammenarbeit zwischen Forschung, Politik und Praxis. Als Ergebnis des Meetings wurde ja die Notwendigkeit adressiert, den Dialog zwischen Forschern, politischen Entscheidungsträgern, Fachleuten aus der Klimawissenschaft und den Denkmalschutzbehörden zum Thema Kultur, Klimawissenschaft, Kulturerbe zu intensivieren und hier auch stärker interdisziplinär und sektorübergreifend äh, zu denken. Und ähm, da würde mich jetzt gerne auch nochmal interessieren, und das ist ein Punkt, den ich mit Ihnen jetzt hier nochmal ganz kurz umreißen wollen würde, ist, inwieweit dieser Aspekt, also eben diese Zusammenhang, dieser Zusammenhang von traditionellem Wissen, äh, Ursachen, Auswirkungen des Klimawandels bereits äh, hierzulande Berücksichtigung in Politik und Förderung findet und wie man letztendlich auch diese sinnvolle Zusammenarbeit, diese erforderliche Zusammenarbeit im deutschsprachigen Raum ein Stück weit auch intensivieren könnte. Denn ich habe jetzt auch so aus den Vorträgen heute mitgenommen, dass das ein zentraler Aspekt ist. Doch alle erschöpft. <lacht> oh ja, Frau Wendland. Und dann Frau Lörz. Ja, ähm ich glaube, dass der, dass der Wille durchaus da ist. Das ähm, haben wir auch schon festgestellt bei, bei unseren Aktivitäten, die ja bisher auch nur kleine waren im, im DNK. Ich sehe allerdings zwei Hürden. Das ist einmal die äh, ministeriale, sektorale Teilung, dass ähm, die Ressorts nicht gut genug miteinander Reden. Das tun die schon im, im, im Alltag nicht und zum Teil sich auch nicht wohl gesonnen sind und dass dadurch viele Brücken auch schwierig sind. Denn es geht ja dann tatsächlich immer auch um Förderung, um, ähm, um, um Wissenstransfer, überhaupt um Berücksichtigung. Und da ist die Denkmalpflege ja manchmal bei der Kultur, manchmal ähm, bei, den, bei den Bauministerien oder sonst wo und die Umweltministerien oder Agrarministerien sind auch wieder andere Planeten. Und da liegt, glaube ich, nach meiner Erfahrung jetzt gerade auch in den letzten zwei Jahren, da sind tiefe Gräben und wir kleinen Akteure können im Grunde da gar nicht ausreichend die, die Brücken bauen. Wir können das sicherlich immer auf der Arbeitsebene, da ähm, da bin ich gar nicht so, so pessimistisch. Aber diese, diese politischen Ebenen, und wir haben ja nicht nur die Bundesressorts, wir haben das Gleiche in den Ländern dann ja wieder vielfach. Und äh, das macht es, glaube ich, nicht, nicht ganz einfach, überhaupt auch wahrgenommen zu werden. Und ein Satz noch, wir, müssen, wir haben ja nicht nur die Bedrohung der, des kulturellen Erbes durch den Klimawandel direkt, sondern wir haben auch die Bedrohung der Schutzinstrumente durch Maßnahmen des Klimawandels, gegen den Klimawandel, allgemeine Maßnahmen. Wenn ich jetzt an die großen Gesetzespakete denke, wo die gesetzlichen ähm, Vorbehalte der öffentlichen Belange oder die Abprüfung und Abwägung der öffentlichen Belange zum Teil richtig ausgehebelt worden ist, ähm, da da wird ganz viel ja auch ähm, so oder unmerklich wird den, den Verantwortlichen für Denkmalschutz und Denkmalpflege einiges aus der Hand genommen, ohne dass man das so im, direkt im 
Alltag merkt. An manchen Stellen werden auch die Denkmalschutzgesetze geändert. Also das, denke ich, müssen wir immer mit berücksichtigen, dass es da auch gerade eine Erosion der Instrumente und ähm, der Zuständigkeiten gibt. Also auch hier eher die Notwendigkeit, stattdessen auf, der, auf die Arbeitsebene zu setzen und hier stärker dann auch den Zusammenhalt zu wahren. Zwei Wortbeiträge würde ich jetzt noch annehmen aufgrund der fortgeschrittenen Zeit. Frau Lössel, wie Sie waren jetzt als nächstes dran und dann der Herr Lohner. Ich hoffe, ich habe jetzt keinen vergessen. Ich schaue noch mal. Nein. Ähm, ja, also ich wollte ähm, anmerken, weil ich jetzt auch, Dadurch, dass ich nicht bei uns im Amt, also ich bin beim Amt für Denkmalpflege im Rheinland, ähm, so auch mit äh, Klimawandel und Katastrophenschutz beschäftige, läuft das alles bei mir auf. Und dann war das jetzt schon mal öfter so, dass ich quasi auch so am Rande diese politischen Diskussionen, also die auf einer äh, Verwaltungsebene stattfinden, mitbekommen habe, auch teilgenommen habe. Ähm, und äh, dort findet ja auch viel Präventionsmaßnahmen statt, also jetzt auch viel nochmal die Wasserwege äh, umgestalten und so weiter. Ähm, und was mir da aber sehr schwer fällt, ist ähm, auszudrücken, wo sind die, ähm, die Knackpunkte fürs Denkmal, warum müssen Denkmäler jetzt unbedingt mehr geschützt werden als äh, ein normale Stadtkern, also die, äh, da gibt es ja einen besonderen Schutz von Schulen. Und Krankenhäusern, das ja durchaus völlig in Ordnung ist, da jetzt irgendwie durchzusetzen, dass die Denkmäler irgendwie äh, wichtiger sind. Also da fehlen mir persönlich auch äh, die, also die Argumente und ähm, dementsprechend fällt die Denkmalpflege da ein bisschen hinten runter, also dass das gar nicht so wirklich diskutiert wird. Und gleichzeitig merke ich aber auch, dass auf der Ebene der praktischen Denkmalpflege dieses Thema Klimawandel, wo müssen wir eingreifen und so weiter, immer sehr, sehr schwammig ist. Also wir haben ganz viele theoretische Sachen, wir haben ganz viel Forschungsmaterial, was jetzt ankommt. Wir haben jetzt irgendwie mhm. ganz viele Projekte, die gelaufen sind. Die bringen aber, um es mal ganz hart zu sagen, in der praktischen Denkmalpflege nicht so viel, weil wir immer nur die Einzelfälle auf dem Tisch haben. Und da fällt es auch wirklich schwer, die eben auf eine Ebene zu heben, wo wir sagen, wir können wirklich in der breiten Masse in der Denkmalpflege ähm, da eine Veränderung ähm, erreichen. Also ob das jetzt irgendwie mit trockenen Böden ist, um dann eine Prävention für alle Kirchen, die vielleicht äh, gefährdet werden, dass, oder für alle Gebäude, dass da sich die Wand absenkt, weil der Boden zu so trocken ist. Also da, das, wir kriegen ja immer nur den Schaden dann am Ende auf den Tisch und der muss dann behoben werden. Und äh, es ist schwierig, da eine Guideline oder Maßnahmen auf den Tisch zu bringen, der das, die da wirklich eine Prävention erreichen und die äh, diese breite Masse erreichen und nicht immer da, wo es eigentlich schon mehr oder minder zu spät ist. Genau. Hm. So, mein Dank. <lacht> ja, herzlichen Dank. Herr Lohner, ich würde Sie jetzt noch dran nehmen. Frau ähm, Scheumann, bitte sehen Sie es mir nach, wären Sie sehr böse, wenn wir Sie ignorieren. Vielleicht mögen Sie Ihr Kommentar in den Chat posten. Ähm, ich möchte nicht unhöflich erscheinen. Gut, Herr Lohner, ein kurzes Statement, ja. wenn Okay, genau. Möglich. Ich kann Frau Wendler nur bestätigen, dass also der Eindruck in den Umweltverbänden auch, was zwischen den Ressorts wenig Kommunikation stattfindet. Ich würde ganz gerne einen ganz prosaischen Hinweis geben. Seit einigen Wochen gibt es ein 4 Milliarden Euro Förderprogramm, also für den Naturschutz eine völlig ungewöhnliche Summe. Das nennt man BMU. Also da gibt es auch auf dem eine große Homepage. Und ich glaube, also wenn Sie gemeinsam mit Umweltakteuren sich das Programm mal anschauen und gemeinsam Anträge stellen, ob allein Denkmalschutzbehörde durchkommt, weiß ich nicht. Findet man mit einiger Fantasie sicher, sicherlich äh, Möglichkeiten, auf dieses Programm zuzugreifen. Und äh, also ich selbst habe jetzt noch keine Erfahrung damit, aber ich glaube, das wäre äh, sinnvoll, das als Anlass zu nehmen, zusammenzuarbeiten, einfach weil die Summen so groß sind, dass es innerhalb der, der Umweltszene äh, schon Munkeleien gibt. Wir schaffen das gar nicht. Vielleicht mögen Sie den Link hier in den Chat stellen. Das ist, denke ich, für viele ein hin ja. sehr wichtiger Hinweis. Gut, ähm Herr Haspel, wollen wir direkt zu Ihnen übergehen? Frau Bösler, Sie hatten eigentlich auch noch eine Frage stellen wollen. 
Das würden wir ausklammern. Ich würde gerne jetzt darauf verzichten, ja. okay. äh, weil das ist also ja auch immer so ein generales Thema mit unseren Förderstrukturen. Ja. Ähm, haben wir jetzt schon beantwortet von Herrn Lohner. Genau, haben wir auch schon angesprochen. <lacht> Herr Lohner hat uns schon sehr praktisch, vier Milliarden in Aussicht gestellt. Das wir das machen. Ähm, wir haben, ich erwähnte das eingangs, mit vor, ein Positionspapier zu machen zum Thema Klimawandel, Kultur, Kulturerbe, Erbe, muss man nochmal sehen. Und es gibt zwei, zwei Fragen, hätte ich, oder wo, ich, wo wir ein Feedback erbitten wollten aus dem großen Kreis. Ähm, das eine ist, was glauben Sie, was könnte die Zielsetzung eines solchen Papiers sein oder was sollten Teilforderungen sein, die auf jeden Fall in so einem Papier mit berücksichtigt werden sollten. Und wenn Sie die Frage beantworten oder Ideen dafür haben oder Forderungen haben, von denen Sie sagen, die sollte man jetzt im Rahmen dieses dbu e commerce projektes weiter transportieren, dann wären wir auch sehr daran interessiert, äh, an Bekundungen, ob Sie oder die in Einrichtungen, die Sie vertreten, bereit wären, da sogar mitzumachen bei der Formulierung. Frau Wendland, war das eine Wortmeldung dazu oder Sie hatten Ihre Hand hier oben? Frau Kohloff hat auch eine Hand, sehe ich jetzt auf jeden das Fall. War noch, das war noch eine, eine Fahne von ja. vorher. Nein, Entschuldigung, ich nehme okay. die weg. Das ist noch eine alte Hand. Eine Beispiel. alte Hand, genau. Alte Hand. Frau Kohloff. Frau Kotto war aber vor mir, aber ich ah. ist okay. <lacht> okay. Ja, also. Ähm, auch das ähm, kann ich mir gut vorstellen, dass wir uns da als DUK sehr gerne an diesem Positionspapier ähm, beteiligen wollen. Müsste ich erstmal im Haus abklären. Das ist das eine. Das andere ist eine Frage, ähm, Herr Haspel. Ist das Positionspapier, also besteht da schon drüber Klarheit? Geht das rein als Appell in den, in den politischen Raum, also als, als Aufruf, als, als wie der Name schon sagt, Positionierung von äh, E-Commerce Deutschland und DBU zu dem Thema. Oder, das fände ich tatsächlich noch einen ganz wichtigen Aspekt immer, wie, wie breit ist das tatsächlich auch gedacht, also als Appell tatsächlich auch an die gesamte Zivilgesellschaft. Seht her, es gibt dieses wichtige Thema. Ähm, wir äußern uns dazu und stellen die wichtigsten äh, Fakten und äh, Positionen und Vorhaben, die wir haben, zusammen. Also in den, wenn ich da kurz darauf antworten darf, ehe ich an Frau Kodowa noch mal weitergebe, ist wir eins ist uns ein Anliegen, dass wir gesagt haben, wir wollen nicht sozusagen in die Welt hinaus Botschaften, Forderungen, Programme senden, sondern der Ausgangspunkt ist im Grunde genommen die Frage, was können, müssen wir selber, die beteiligten Einrichtungen, dafür tun. Es kann von mir aus anfangen, sozusagen mit der Klimabilanz der Einrichtungen und des Fahrzeugparks und enden bei der Frage der Handhabung von denkmalrechtlichen Regelungen oder der Möglichkeit, Ausnahmen zu schaffen. Aber es ist sozusagen ein Stück weit immer ein Appell auch an uns selber und zu sagen, wir müssen etwas daran ändern und die Glaubwürdigkeit nimmt in dem Maße vielleicht zu, wo das eine oder andere gemacht werden kann. Wir haben von der Vereinigung der Landesdenkmalpfleger dieses Programm, wir haben was Vergleichbares von der Deutschen Stiftung Denkmalschutz. Und wollen wir das nicht replizieren oder eine dritte Variante machen, sondern wir haben gesagt, wir würden das gerne machen, weil wir das wichtig finden für die E-Commerce-interne Kommunikation natürlich auch. Und für die Kommunikation mit unseren Partnerinnen äh, und Partnern, dass sie sagen, wenn es so ein Positionspapier gäbe, wir haben noch nicht mal die Zahl der Positionen bislang festgelegt, aber dann wäre das doch ganz hilfreich, um das nach draußen äh, zu bringen und auch deutlich zu machen natürlich, dass die Denkmalpflege oder die Denkmale oder die Kultur nicht nur betroffen sind, weil sie möglicherweise gefährdet sind und Anpassungsmaßnahmen erfolgen müssen oder erlitten werden müssen, sondern weil sie auch ein historisches Arsenal und historische Erfahrungen mobilisieren kann, die vielleicht künftig von Bedeutung sind. Das ist so der Gratanung. Und wenn Sie sagen, die Duck ist dabei, ist das schon mal gut. Und wenn Sie in der zweiten Äußerung noch mal was sagen, ob möglicherweise aus den Zuständigkeiten der Deutschen UNESCO-Kommission 
wenn Sie das sagen können, ohne mit Ihrem Generalsekretär und der Präsidentin... Ich kläre das erstmal ab. Ich glaube, das ist genau... Ja, Gucken wir mal. Frau Scheuermann. Achso, Entschuldigung, jetzt Frau Kotowa und dann Frau Scheuermann. Das ist, ich habe die Hände übersehen. Kein, kein Problem, Herr Hatzkoll. Ich bin hier außerirdisch, ich bin Klimaforscherin. Ich habe mit Denkmalschatz nichts zu tun. Und ich würde sagen, ich würde dieses Positionpapier ganz gerne unterstützen von Herzen oder unserem Climate Service Center und hier und Center wird unterstützen. Und die ähm, Grün ist ganz einfach. Konstante hat mich gestern gefragt oder vorgestern, so ob ich diese Information über diese Workshop in unsere Netzwerke so rein platzieren könnte. Und ich habe jetzt tatsächlich überlegt, gibt es überhaupt Netzwerke von Klimaforscher, die an die äh, Kulturerbe interessieren sind, weil das eigentlich, das ist zweiseitige äh, Prozess, zum Beispiel, das ist ganz wichtig, dass die Leute in Denkmalpflege interessieren und sich um Klimawandel, aber das ist ganz wichtig, dass die Klimaforscher auch Gedanken machen können, welche Informationen wir für Kulturerbe zur Verfügung stellen können. Wo sind unsere Herausforderung, Herausforderung für Klimawissenschaft? Und ich finde, das ist ganz, ganz wichtig. Ja, vielen Dank für den Hinweis. Das hatten wir bei der Auftakttagung. Wir sind ja jetzt sozusagen in einer Auswertungssitzung und hatten auch eine Inputsitzung für diese Verhandlungen im letzten Dezember. Da waren von der klimawissenschaftlichen Seite eine stärkere Beteiligung, als jetzt in der Auswertungsphase festzustellen. Das heißt, dass man merkt sozusagen, dass diese, die Säulen stehen noch ziemlich nebeneinander, relativ lose, verbunden, vielleicht irgendwo im Untergrund, aber nicht sichtbar auf jeden Fall. Und auch das wird auch nicht in, zur Kenntnis genommen von den einzelnen Säulen. Und das muss, glaube ich, verbessert werden. Das ist ein, ein Anliegen dieses Positionspapiers, wenn ich sage, nach innen. Dann geht es aber vor allem darum zu sagen, wir müssen versuchen, vielleicht nicht mit einer Stimme zu sprechen, aber zu sagen, es ist ein gemeinsames Anliegen. Klimaschutz und Denkmalschutz zusammenzubringen. Und die Denkmalpflege hat da nicht nur ihre Nöte mit, sondern sie hat auch was anzubieten. Oder die Kultur hat etwas anzubieten, weil die schafft die Resilienz. Frau Scheuermann, Frau Bösler und dann Franziska Haas. Ja, ich würde das gerne unterstützen, was Frau Kolova gerade gesagt hat und fände es wichtig für so ein Papier mehr über Erhalten, über Pflege, und was dazugehört, auch unser Erfahrungswissen einzubringen, als vielleicht ein Papier zu Denkmalpflege und Kulturerbebewahrung zu formulieren. Dass man von vornherein in dem Anspruch und in der Ausrichtung, in dem Konzept des Papiers deutlich macht, es geht um mehr als nur unseren Bereich, wo wir im Moment zuständig sind. Und dass wir das, was wir heute früh diskutiert haben, wirklich dann auch ernst nehmen und den Naturschutz dazu nehmen und wirklich das als interdisziplinäres Projekt anlegen. Denn die Frage der Erhaltung, die haben die anderen Fächer auch und die, die Notwendigkeit der Pflege auch. Und ich denke, das könnte ein gemeinsamer Nenner sein. Ja, danke schön. Frau Bösler und Frau Haas noch. Ja, ich wollte noch mal betonen, die Bedeutung, die... Ähm, die darin liegt, dass wir in der Denkmalpflege, in den Kulturerbeeinrichtungen auch überhaupt tätig werden, auch dass es deutlich wird, wo, was wir tun und wo wir etwas tun. Ich habe heute Morgen ja schon diese Aktion erwähnt, der jungen Klimaaktivisten, die sich dort an Gemälde festgeklebt haben, um tatsächlich auch die Kulturerbe-Community darauf aufmerksam macht, ihr müsst jetzt was tun. Und ich finde, dieser Appell ist vollkommen gerechtfertigt und wir sollten den auch für uns ernst nehmen. Und auf der anderen Seite sollten wir eben auch tatsächlich uns selber prüfen, was gelingt uns selber zum jetzigen Zeitpunkt zu tun. Das ist natürlich auch immer dann entwicklungsfähig und entwickelbar. Und je mehr Institutionen und Positionen da zusammenkommen, desto besser wird so ein Papier. Ja, danke schön. Frau Haas. Ja, ich vertrete ja weniger eine deutsche Institution als vielmehr dieses internationale wissenschaftliche Komitee Energie und Nachhaltigkeit in E-Commerce. Ähm, trotzdem würde ich äh, gerne äh, 
in dem Rahmen an diesem Positionspapier äh, mitwirken. Und ich finde, was sehr wichtig ist und was dringend ist, auch in der Kommunikation, was ja vorher schon viel angesprochen wurde, ist, dass man sich weniger auf das zurückzieht, was wir sozusagen bisher getan haben und sagt, das war super, das machen wir einfach so weiter, sondern dass man eigene Positionen überdenkt, eigene Prioritätensetzung überdenkt und darüber nachdenkt, was man ändern muss im Angesicht dieses Klimawandels, ähm, wo wir einfach auch als äh, Denkmalpfleger und andere Wissenschaftler ähm, die Notwendigkeit sehen, ähm, unsere eigenen Praktiken äh, sozusagen anzupassen und ich glaube, das ist ähm, sehr wichtig und vielleicht so ein kleiner Kritikpunkt ist es, was mich so manchmal so ein bisschen stört, ist oft so auf dieses Thema ähm, Denkmalschutz ist Klimaschutz zurückgeführt wird und ich finde, in diese Richtung sollte es eben nicht gehen, sondern es sollte deutlich machen, dass man sich bewegt, dass man in die Zukunft denkt, dass man weiter nachdenkt. Vielen, vielen Dank für den Appell an die Reflexivität auch der Denkmalpflege, dass sie das, dass sie sozusagen das nicht in eins setzen kann, so schön das klingt natürlich nach außen. Aber das löst, glaube ich, das Problem nicht. Und das ist, glaube ich, schon ein ganz wichtiger Beitrag dazu zu sehen, welche, welche, welche Stellschrauben sind möglicherweise im Denkmalverständnis und auch in der Prinzipienbildung äh, anpassungsbedürftig. Ich will ja gar nicht sagen, dass die Revi der, der Revision ausgesetzt werden sollen, aber die muss man sozusagen irgendwie weiterdenken und aktualisieren. Jetzt habe ich, hätte ich äh, eine Frage noch mal bei Herr Lohner, Sie hatten sich in diesem letzten Punkt, wenn ich es richtig notiert habe, nicht gemeldet. Aber für uns wäre natürlich die Frage, ob BUND, NABU oder andere mögliche Partner eines solchen Positionspapiers sein könnten, zumal ja beide satzungsgemäß sozusagen das Kulturerbe auch mit als, als Schutzauftrag äh, begreifen. Also ich kann jetzt nicht für den NABU sprechen, aber beim BUND ist so, dass wenn Sie die Satzungen der Landesverbände und auch den Bundesverband lesen, dort steht unter den Satzungszielen in den ersten Paragraphen in der Regel immer Kulturschutz auch dabei. Das heißt, seit einigen Jahren, also ich habe es nur in Berlin initiiert vor ein paar Jahren, äh, ist das mit drin. Ehrlicherweise muss man aber sagen, äh, dass das nicht im Fokus der vielen Ehrenamtlichen steht oder im speziellen Fokus der vielen Ehrenamtlichen. Das heißt aber nicht, dass es auf den jeweiligen Ebenen nicht immer Akteure gibt, die dafür offen sind, weil ich gerade noch reden darf. In diesem natürlichen Klimaschutzprogramm, da kann man bis Mitte oder Ende Oktober Vorschläge machen. Da gibt es einen Online-Dialog und ich würde Sie alle aufrufen, einigermaßen konzertiert sich dort zu Wort zu melden mit Ihren Themen, weil das fließt natürlich dann in die Ausgestaltung der konkreten Fördermittelvergaben ein. Ja, vielen Dank. Das haben Sie uns schon im Chat geschickt, wo das, wohin wir uns wenden. Dürfen, ja, das steht oder? schon, also in dieser Demo, natürlich der Klimaschutz, was Frau Fuhrmann ah, ja. geschickt ja. hat, da gibt es einen Link zu Online-Dialog. Ja, vielen, vielen Dank. Dank. Dankeschön, Herr Lohner. Jetzt habe ich keine Wortmeldung mehr. Ich, wir haben das notiert und es wird auch, wir werden versuchen, die ganze Veranstaltung zugänglich zu machen, so dass sie auch zum Nachlesen und Nachhören äh, zur Verfügung steht, weil einige ja auch nicht die ganze Zeit daran teilnehmen könnten. Und würde jetzt zum Schluss übergeben wieder an Frau Fuhrmann, die uns mit uns die Frage diskutiert, wie weiter unabhängig von der Frage des Positionspapiers. Frau Fuhrmann. Ja, herzlichen Dank, Herr Haspel. Ich ähm, denke, dass gerade das, was dieser Punkt, den Sie gerade gesagt hatten, Herr Lohner, dass das schon ein ganz guter Abschluss ist, nämlich ähm, der Punkt, sich stärker in Form von Dialogformaten einzubringen. Und das war auch das, was wir jetzt noch mal als Frage formulieren wollten. Denn wir hatten jetzt auch in der Diskussion zur Vorbereitung auf heute überlegt, wie wir eben auch diese Formate, diese Dialoge auch verstetigen können. Denn es war ja wirklich auch ein sehr umfassendes Projekt, was wir hier gestartet haben mit äh, wirklich sehr, sehr wichtigen Ergebnissen. Und äh, man merkt ja auch sehr stark aus der Praxis, dass jetzt der Bedarf da ist, genau diese Thematik auch zu diskutieren. Also dass auf allen Ebenen des Kultur, Kulturerbesektors. Und ähm, da wollten wir mit Ihnen jetzt auch noch mal ganz kurz ähm, 
diskutieren, wie sie jetzt äh, gerne diesen Dialog verstetigen möchten. Also es stand die Überlegung im Raum, Frau Wendland, wir hatten uns da ja auch schon mal zu verständigt, dass man ähm, vielleicht das eine oder andere Dialogformat nochmal versucht umzusetzen in Form eines Online-Salons, so wie wir das als DBU letztes Jahr auch schon erstmalig gemacht haben. Ralf Kilian ähm, hatte angesprochen, äh, die Gründung eines Arbeitskreises, äh, was ich sehr gut finde, denn das würde letztendlich auch die Idee von dir, Lola, aufgreifen, da eben auch vielleicht Klimawissenschaftler äh, mit aufzunehmen, um da eben auch diese Notwendigkeit, die ja jetzt auch im, Inter des, äh, im internationalen Projekt äh, ja, diskutiert wurde, eben diese Notwendigkeit der De Interdisziplinarität stärker dann auch voranzutreiben. Und das würde ich jetzt hier gerne noch mal kurz abschließend diskutieren wollen. Ähm, vielleicht mögen Sie nur noch mal kurz mir Ihren Wunsch mitteilen und dann denke ich, haben wir es auch geschafft und ähm, würden dann auch die Veranstaltung heute damit beenden. Ich denke, das ist dann auch ein ganz guter Schluss. Frau Vormann, Sie hatten vorher nach dem Erschöpfungszustand Wahrscheinlich jetzt der und dann haben Sie uns alle 10 Minuten Verlängerung oder 15 Minuten Verlängerung gegeben und offenbar ist jetzt die Deadline bei allen ja. Beteiligten <lacht> überschritten. Aber, Aber wir haben es ja letztendlich auch schon ja, andiskutiert. Wir kriegen ne? also, einzelne Meldungen und wir stehen ja. ja sicher auch alle zur Verfügung, wenn es weitere Anregungen und Überlegungen gibt. Und jetzt habe ich noch zwei Meldungen, nämlich Herr Mitzke und Frau Wendland und gebe das auch wieder zurück dann an Frau Vormann für die Moderation. Herr Mitzke. Ähm, ja, ich hatte nur gerade eine ganz fixe Idee ähm, bezüglich der Fachgruppen oder Arbeitskreisbildung. Und zwar wäre es vielleicht eine Idee, das unter dem, unter dem Deckmantel der Scientists for Future zu machen, weil damit hat man ja gleichzeitig einen, einen interdisziplinären Austausch und könnte da gegebenenfalls eine Fachgruppe für Klimaschutz und ähm, Kulturerbe erhalt integrieren. Ja, danke. Haben Sie da Kontakte, Herr Mitschke? Ähm, noch nicht. Ich habe mich nun mal mit Scientists for Future ein bisschen angelesen. Okay. Ähm, aber ich denke, das ist durchaus möglich, da einen Kontakt herzustellen. Dankeschön. Ja, herzlichen Dank, Frau Wendland. Ja, also das abschließende jetzt, Wort an Sie. Ich habe auch noch kein richtiges Bild für, für einen Arbeitskreis. Und wir müssen, denke ich, auch vorsichtig sein, dass man, dass man nicht immer noch neue... Ähm, ja. Ja, Gremien äh, gründet. Aber ich würde sagen, das, was ich heute an, an Vernetzung gesehen habe, fand ich ähm, außerordentlich interessant. Und ich fand aber auch, nicht weil wir es gemacht haben, sondern weil sich ähm, auf unserer Tagung ähm, Denkmalschutz ist aktiver äh, Klimaschutz auch Netzwerke gefunden haben, die sich sonst nicht sehen. Also zum Beispiel die jetzt überall entstehenden Aktivitäten im Bereich der Bauwirtschaft, Immobilienwirtschaft, der ArchitektInnen, ähm, Bauingenieure, Kli Haustechniker. Ähm, das ist ja auch ein, ein großer Bereich. Und, und ob, man, ob man tatsächlich an so, so fluiden Netzwerkstrukturen arbeitet, dass man überhaupt schon mal voneinander weiß, dass man Adressenverteiler hat und dann vielleicht auch fallweise zusammenschaltet. Also das, was Frau fuhr man eben sagte, so mit, mit Denkmalsalon. Also dass man innerhalb bestehender Strukturen sich noch stärker vernetzt, ohne ähm, ja, neue Kreise zu gründen. Die, ich glaube, wir sind alle in, in, in genug Kreisen. Ne? Das, ähm, deswegen war jetzt vielleicht auch die Reaktion so etwas verhalten. Aber ich bin auf jeden Fall fürs DNK gerne bereit, da daran auch mitzuwirken. Das finde ich ähm, schon, was auch heute hier war, sehr, einen sehr wertvollen Pool von, von unterschiedlichen ExpertInnen. Danke. Und Frau Wendland, ich glaube, wir nehmen das natürlich auch mit, dass es nach Ihrer Einschätzung und offenbar, wenn ich die Zurückhaltung richtig interpretiere, auch nach Einschätzung der anderen sozusagen nicht eines neuen Kreises oder einer neuen Spezialisierung jetzt bedarf, sondern im Grunde bedarf es irgendwie der der, der Vernetzung oder der Integration 
diese unterschiedlichen Seiten. Und das betrifft ja nicht nur die Kultur- und Naturseite, sondern aus meiner Sicht sehr viel stärker die ganze klimawissenschaftliche Seite, wo mir sehr lieb wäre, wenn es uns gelänge, Mittel und Wege zu finden, die stärker einzubeziehen oder uns dort stärker mit einzubringen, weil die zwei Sphären wirken ja schon noch äh, ziemlich getrennt im Augenblick. Da, Gut, da Herr Haspel, das, selber, das war doch schon das richtige Schlusswort. Ich wollte kein Schlusswort schreiben, sondern ich muss mich entschuldigen, weil ich yeah. die Ausstellung eröffnen muss. Und äh, ich bedanke mich aber bei allen Beteiligten sehr herzlich dafür, dass das zustande gekommen ist. Bei Ihnen, Frau Fuhrmann und der DBU, Herrn Bonde und allen Beteiligten dafür, dass Sie nach langem Anlauf, nach mehrfachem Anlauf, äh, das ganze Vorhaben gefördert haben und dass wir jetzt auch das schaffen, das sozusagen aus dieser globalen Perspektive wieder auf eine, äh, auf, auf eine Region zu beziehen, in der wir selber tätig sind sind und in der wir selber aktiv sind und auch äh, nachdenken können. Bei, bei Frau Bösler und Frau Baudis dafür, dass sie das über so lange Zeit hier mit durchgehalten haben und ich davon ausgehe, dass wir auch in die Verlängerung gehen, liebe Frau Bösler, und das dann verstetigen, weil das war ja sozusagen von Anfang an unsere Anliegen. Also herzlichen Dank dafür. Herzlichen Dank an diejenigen, die in der, der Geschäftsstelle das mit ermöglicht haben und vor allem in ICOMOS Paris, äh, Gaia Jungeblut, äh, Marie-Laure Lavenir und, und andere, äh, die die Vorbereitung jetzt wieder übernommen haben und die das uns überhaupt technisch ermöglicht haben, dass wir diese Art von Veranstaltung durchführen könnten. Das wäre mit unseren spärlichen Mitteln sonst wahrscheinlich total gescheitert oder in der Deskommunikation äh, hätte das dann geändert. Also vielen Dank für alle und sehen Sie es mir nach, wenn ich mich jetzt zurückziehe. Ich will äh, und ich würde vielleicht die Regie dann an Frau Fuhrmann geben äh, und äh, mich, mich selber ausklinken müssen. Entschuldigung. Dankeschön. Ja, ich denke, wir alle müssen uns jetzt ausklinken. Wir hatten jetzt wirklich einen sehr ergiebigen und intensiven Tag und das muss man natürlich jetzt auch erstmal ein bisschen sacken lassen und verdauen. Und ich freue mich sehr über die intensive Teilnahme hier, über die rege Teilnahme und möchte mich bei allen ganz, ganz herzlich bedanken und Sie jetzt auch entlassen und würde mich sehr freuen, wenn wir diesbezüglich zu diesem sehr wichtigen Thema weiter in Kontakt bleiben könnten. Ja, auch von meiner Seite herzlichen Dank an alle. Bis bald. Bis bald, danke. Tschüss. Ja, vielen Dank. Tschüss. Tschüss. Tschüss.